When the arguments fail, use a blackjack. That was the advice of one Edward Spike O'Donnell, one of the rare breed of gangsters from the Prohibition era, to retire from the rackets, maintain his political clout, and incredibly, for a gangster of his time, actually die of natural causes. So many of his fellow Irish mobsters would not be so lucky. They were just as violent as he was, and oftentimes that violence eventually would come back on them. Existing since the middle of the 19th century, when Irish immigrants suffering from famine and disease began to search for new lives in America and needed all the help they could get in the face of rising anti-Irish sentiment, the assortment of street gangs, collectively referred to as the Irish mob, grew and thrived, becoming a force that would help shape America's criminal underworld for centuries. It would also shape a lot of pop culture, from the movies that starred James Cagney, who got many of his mannerisms from the Irish mobsters he knew, like Angels with Dirty Faces, to Martin Scorsese's Gangs in New York, to The Departed, which won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Pop culture has been fascinated with Irish mobsters for a very long time. Beginning mainly in New York and Boston, Irish immigrants arrived in droves and often entered the criminal underworld, even if they didn't necessarily want to. It was simply what they felt they had to do to survive. Irish bosses, who were already established, were soon offering these new immigrants food and shelter in exchange for their votes. Simultaneously, ghetto-like conditions gave rise to Irish street gangs who battled it out viciously with anti-immigrant gangs in early America's urban streets using whatever weapon they had on hand. And some of these weapons, we'll talk about them later. Dear God, are they terrifying to think about being attacked with. These gangsters were also often goons for hire, happy to smack or whack whoever you wanted for the right price. And then as the Irish rose in cultural prominence, they gained important positions in city governments across America, often using those positions to protect their own, protect the gangsters that put them into these positions of power. Corrupt? Yes. But depending on your moral compass, maybe justified in certain cases. The history of the Irish mob is a long one, rife with bloodshed, backstabbing, and more gang wars than you can count. It's also the history of a culture's improbable rise to power in a country that originally considered them to be borderline subhuman. I found a lot of similarities between today's topic with the formation of the Bloods and Crips in South Central Los Angeles, a topic we examined in episode 318. Oppress a population enough, make them desperate and angry enough, and you've given them a whole bunch of incentive to leave the law behind in order to survive and sometimes thrive by any means necessary. The story of the Irish mob is sometimes inspiring, sometimes horrifying, oftentimes stomach turning, and I'm excited for you to hear it. The Irish mob on today's bloodiest fuck, rags to riches. Who do you think you're talking to? Do you know who the fuck I am? Do not make me grab my brick bat edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the Master Sucker, Saturday morning cartoon pitchman, personal revelation skeptic, and you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, the Burn It All Down tour will be over by the time this comes out. Thanks again to everyone who bought a ticket, truly. Uh, I hope you buy more in the future. Now that I got a little taste of headlining the theater tour, theater tour, uh, I want more. Uh, such a great way to present material, especially when it's often long form and sometimes absurd stories. Need that extra uh, a bit of bit of focus from the audience that a theater allows. Uh, now, when this comes out, focusing on building a brand new act in the clubs, which are also very fun. Uh, I've been writing so many new possibilities, kicking off new shows in Phoenix, April 21st and 22nd at Stand Up Live. Then it's May 4th, 5th, and 6th in Bloomington, Indiana at the Comedy Attic. And then May 11th, 12th, and 13th in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Comedy on State. So DanCummins.tv for tickets. Also had a blast in New Orleans and uh, Philadelphia. And had something happen in Philly that has never happened to me before in over two decades of stand-up. Had to stop the show because I literally almost killed somebody. Kind of not kidding. During the show, someone in the audience had a heart attack, full cardiac arrest, stopped breathing. Thank God, beautiful meat sack Marlena Lusby, ER nurse and fan, was there, sprang into action, went full hero, and got this man breathing again. All I know is that he was stabilized at the hospital later. The ambulance was there within five minutes of being called. So uh, kudos to the EMTs. Uh, Marlena, you literally saved this person's life. If anyone knows what happened to this guy after being stabilized, please email us, bojangles at timesoakpodcast.com. And we'd also like to be able to update Marlena. Hail Marlena, you hero. Uh, Also met several fans in Philly who are heading to summer camp this year in Pennsylvania. If you want to join them, 
this September 21st through the 24th in Northern Pennsylvania, an all-inclusive adult summer camp with an open bar, live scared to death, live stand-up show uh, with me, Chad Daniels, Kelsey Cook, who's killing it right now with their new special uh, and more. You can stay overnight in modern camp lodging, set on a beautiful private lake. So many activities. Just go to badmagicmerch.com. Scroll down to the Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp banner. Check out the fact page if you got questions. Watch the promo video. Get excited and get the info you need. Uh, last thing, also at badmagicmerch.com, a new collection. The Family Jewels Collection, darling. Uh, grandest greetings. Clark Rockefeller here to promote the newest luxury collection inspired by the Time Suck episode on me, the one and only Clark Rockefeller. <laughs> uh, made of pure diamonds and gold. This opulent collection is fit only for friends of, say, uh, uh, Franz Klein or Andy Warhol. Or, of course, me, uh, Clark Rockefeller. Uh, choose from a golden diamond encrusted Time Suck logo accompanied with a dazzling selection of Tanzanian diamonds, a luxury designed pattern backpack, and a designer can holder for those peach Melba martini nights. It'll simply be grand, darling. Head over to badmagicmerch.com today. And now on to a topic that our Patreon space leaders have voted in. The Irish Mob was supposed to release it last week, but we just had too much Jeffrey Lundgren to talk about. Uh, Going to be way less poop this week. feel like we already hit our poop quota for all of 2023 with the Lundgren two-parter. No one this week is going to suffer quite like Skidmark. But there will be so much suffering. These guys were so violent. It's insane. And it's such a big subject. The Irish mob dates back all the way to the 1840s in America. So many notable figures came up in the Irish-American underworld. So many people that vied for their little slice of the American dream through less than legal means. And we're going to meet a lot of them today. A lot of people you would have been wise to never, ever cross had you ran into them. We're also going to be immersed in the world of Ireland. We've been to Ireland a few times here uh, in the suck first, most notably on our in our suck on Celtic mythology. But rather than the world of myths and legends, today we're dealing with some very concrete, less than ideal oftentimes realities. Not the kind of realities we explored on our suck about Jameson's whiskey, though. No cannibalism in this story, alleged or otherwise. No poop, no cannibalism. Sorry if that really bums you out. Today in Ireland, we'll be looking at what life was like for the average Irish immigrant coming into the U.S. in the middle of the 19th century. In that way, today's episode, in addition to being spiritually related to the Bloods and Crips suck, also related to the Irish Republican Army suck. Irish gangs were born out of Irish resistance to very oppressive British rule. You know, what were they fleeing? Uh, what did they face over in the UK versus over here? Uh, were the Irish really discriminated against, uh, as many claim? Well, the short answer to that last one is no, actually. Uh, the Irish were, as they still are, probably the whiniest group of people on earth. And they can't help it. I'm not even mad at them. Uh, if there truly are some ethnic groups genetically inferior to others, the Irish do top that list. They are born heavily predisposed to be drunk, illiterate, violent liars with pasty skin and way too many freckles. Even their fucking melanin is lazy. It refuses to work hard enough to cover all of their creepy skin. This is not going to be a fun episode for me to do because I fucking hate Irish people. I hate their favorite foods, Lucky Charms and pork chops. I hate their favorite desserts, double mint chocolate chip ice cream sundaes and gummy worms. And I hate their most famous celebrities, Liam Neeson and Arsenio Hall. I hate their favorite bands and musicians, U2 and the Wu-Tang Clan. Sorry, that was neither a short answer nor a correct one. Uh, I think it's okay for me to say whatever I want about Irish people since 23andMe says I'm 52.5% Irish, British, and Scottish. And it doesn't say how much of each. So for this episode, I'm going to be 52% uh, Irish and 0.5% British and Scottish. I may swap that uh, for a British or Scottish episode down the road. Uh, now, the short answer to the question of were the Irish really discriminated against as many claim is yes. And that, along with crushing poverty, is part of the reason that the Irish mob sprung up in the first place. To take care of people when the government did not give a shit. The Irish gangs were born when many prominent American people actually thought the Irish were an invasive species threatening the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant way of life. So let us begin. In the beginning of Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas, arguably up there with the Godfather trilogy of films, one of the best and most famous American gangster films of all time, uh, as protagonist Henry Hill talks about how he always wanted to be a gangster, Tony Bennett's Rags to Riches plays. Right? I'd, I know I'd go from rags to riches if you would only say you care, and though my pocket may be empty, I'd be a millionaire. And later he sings, must I forever be a beggar whose golden dreams will not come true 
or will I go from rags to riches? My fate is up to you. While the song is a love song, in the context of this film, the you could arguably be the mafia that Henry Hill so adored. To gain the trust, the inclusion of the organized crime syndicate was to not only achieve emotional validation in the form of becoming an accepted and important member of a community, a real family of sorts, but to also often become wealthy beyond one's wildest dreams. One of the reasons we're so obsessed with organized crime and it's uh, many, you know, permu- permutation, excuse me, is that it offers in general an amazing realization of the American dream. The story of building a vast fortune, even when you come from nothing. In this case, a story of an underdog circumventing unjust obstacles, unjust laws that sought to keep them at the bottom and still managed to rise to the top. And though Goodfellas dealt with Italian Americans, the same rags to riches narrative also applies to the subject of our episode today, the Irish mob. Though many believe that the American mob began as an Italian institution transplanted directly from Sicily, uh, that is not true. Criminal traditions in Sicily, known variously as vendetta societies or uh, Cosa Nostra or simply La Mafia, were transported to the U.S. with the beginnings of Italian immigration in the late 1880s and 1890s. The Irish had been in the U.S. for over 40 years by then. And in the American underworld, which was based at that time on the criminal infiltration of the political system for social advancement and economic game, gain, excuse me, was already firmly entrenched. And by the time the Italian mob made it onto the scene, the Irish were a couple generations deep into moving along their own rags to riches journeys. And they really did begin with rags. And oftentimes, literally. In the early 19th century, Ireland was a very dreary place, made up mainly of thousands and thousands of small farms being worked by seriously impoverished farmers. Most of the lands were rented out to the Irish tenants by wealthy landlords, mainly English landlords, who often didn't live anywhere near them. Most Irish families barely scraped together a living as poorly paid, easily replaceable laborers working their own ancestral lands. Property laws passed by British rulers based largely far away in London made it nearly impossible for tenant farmers to achieve even a little bit of upward social mobility. They could be evicted at any time for any reason, basically. And the English did not stop at just uh, financially exploiting the Irish. The names of all the streets and towns were changed from their original Gaelic into the King's English. And not only that, the native Irish language was banned by British law. Long before Americans were trying to erase African and American Indian culture in North America, the British were doing the same shit to the Irish across the Atlantic. This oppressive colonial system was enforced by a brutal justice system. Under various Irish penal laws passed in the 17th century, for example, Catholics, and at that time, essentially every Irish family was Catholic, so really Irish people, could not hold commission in the army, enter almost any profession, or even own a fucking horse worth more than five pounds. Like, so absurd. Of course you can own a horse. Don't be crazy. Just not, just not a good one. You, you can have as many shitty horses as you want. Uh, Catholics could not possess weaponry, not any form of arms. They could not study law, could not study medicine. They could not speak or read Gaelic. They could not even play traditional Irish music. Catholic clergy were expelled from the country, were liable to instant execution when found. For a brief time, Irish were not even allowed to live inside fucking towns. Like just towns in general, like they were wild animals, just vermin. Just go, go on, get, get out of here, you Irish dogs. Back to you, back to the farms. Go pick your dirty taters, you lowly ginger fucks. Export trade was forbidden as Irish commerce and industry were deliberately destroyed. After a series of rebellions, these laws were specifically passed not to be fair in any way, shape, or form. They were passed to break the backs of the Irish. The penal laws were intended to degrade the Irish so severely they would never again be in a position to seriously threaten Protestant rule. In 1600, Protestants, read British, owned just 10% of Ireland's land. And then through all these laws, through all this discrimination, the English got what they wanted. By 1778, Protestants, again, read British, owned 95% of the land, from 10% to 95%. It was resistance to this severe, unfair oppression that would give rise to the organizational structure that would later come to define the Irish mob in America. So pretty interesting, right? I think so easy for us to sometimes just assume that people join gangs or so-called organized crime because they're terrible people, just violent bullies, too lazy and arrogant to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and rise up, you know, the quote, right way. Selfish motherfuckers with shitty moral compasses who are willing to do whatever to whomever to make sure that they get theirs. And, you know, that description fits for some, but for many... 
They were people given almost zero honest opportunities for advancement who rather than just quietly take their lumps and accept a life of unjust squalor thought, hey, you know what? Fuck that. And fuck anyone who gets in my way when I do everything I can to climb as far as I can. Going to tip all the rules in your favor? Well, then fuck your rules. Fuck you. Watch me put my own people in power to change those rules and oppress you. By the early 19th century, what remained of an anti-colonial movement in Ireland became a group of largely secret resistance societies a.k.a. loosely structured organizations that used a strategy of sabotage and violence to disrupt the colonial government, especially in rural areas of the country. The IRA was not the only resistance movement in town. Uh, gangs like the White Boys, the Ribbon Men, the Molly Maguires, they were comprised of members of the community who circulated openly, but whose membership in the underground resistance movement was a well-guarded secret. These gangs presented themselves as community activists. However, before thinking they were nothing short of noble, in times of trouble, they were just as likely to victimize their own as the other side. I guess when you've already crossed a lot of uh, legal, moral lines in the name of fighting oppressors, maybe gotten a little taste of making good money doing so, and then you come across an opportunity to make more of that money by, you know, taking from your own, maybe not so difficult to rationalize your actions. Especially when not doing so leaves you and uh, maybe your family hungry. Desperate times and all that. The entirety of human existence has always been in some way a battle for limited resources. And the more bad the times, the worse the fighting for those resources. And worse times for the Irish were coming. In 1845, the rural resistance societies and most all other forms of social interaction, underground or otherwise, were largely brought to a halt by a tiny agricultural virus known as, and bear with, bear with me here, Phytophthora infestans. Phytophthora infestans. There had been blights before in the country's potato crop, but not like this. Right, this uh, just uh, destroyed everything. And the potato was uh, both a product for export and a food source that sustained the nation. Normally, the potato was a, a hardy tuber that always bounced back from a tough crop cycle. This time, however, the virus struck at the root and spread like wildfire, wiping out entire crops in 1845, 1846, 1847, and so on. And how could this happen? How could an entire population be so foolish to allow themselves to be dependent on one crop? Were they just poor planters? A bunch of drunk savages not smart enough to do anything but plant and dig up taters? No, not at all. Once again, it goes back to the British. For nearly a century leading up to the disaster, the economy of Ireland had been artificially engineered via more bullshit oppressive laws to produce one product and one product only. Regressive corn laws were passed that made it economically impossible for Irish farmers to make a profit off the export of literally anything other than the fucking potato. The Irish had basically been turned into slaves, only allowed to do the very limited amount of things the British allowed them to do. Slaves given just barely enough freedom to maybe keep from revolting. When the crop was wiped out, the result was nearly complete and total devastation of Irish culture. Families starved to death in their fucking cottages or begged in the streets and were reduced to subhuman levels of substance. An archdeacon who toured the village of Kenmare wrote, On one road, the deaths are three each day. The people are buried without coffins. I daily witness the most terrible spectacles. Women, children, and old men crawling out of their homes on all fours, perhaps from beside a corpse, to crave a morsel of any kind. Holy shit. Just envision that. Literally crawling around, begging for food like dogs. And this the direct result of centuries of British oppression. Another witness wrote, the cries of starving hundreds that besiege me from morning until night actually ring in my ears. I attended myself a poor woman whose infant, dead two days, lay at the foot of the bed and four others nearly dead in the same bed. A famished cat got up on the corpse of the poor infant and was about to gnaw it, but for my interference. I could tell you such tales of woe without end. Four starving family members laying together half dead in the same bed while the emaciated family cat tries to eat their fucking dead sibling. For those that didn't succumb to literal starvation, fatal diseases caused by malnutrition were just around the corner. With their bodies too weak to fight the illnesses, thousands died and the bodies were often ceremoniously piled along the side of the road to be taken to mass graves and dumped. So I guess rather unceremoniously. Like their bodies were nothing more than sacks of garbage just being hauled off to the local landfill. One of these illnesses, called sore mouth, was a result of eating such non-nutritious food that the people who acquired it eventually were not able to digest actually actual food anymore. They had damaged their stomach linings and bowels too extensively to be able to eat normal food again. 
People literally boiling, eating boots and other shit you're never going to find in the food pyramid. As you can imagine, the British were not going to save the day. The British response to reports of mass starvation in their Irish colony just a few miles across the English Channel has been most charitably characterized as a kind of criminal negligence. Best personified in the public comments of Sir Charles uh, Trevelyan, Secretary of the Treasury in London during the famine, and the man who single-handedly controlled Irish relief programs. Ireland's great evil, he stated, was not famine, but the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. Man, he just went uh, full send on, uh, yeah, they did that shit to themselves, right? Much easier place to go mentally than, oh, fuck, what have we done? What have we done to these poor people? Anyway, thanks to strong Irish sentiment or anti-Irish sentiment, there was no, no stemming the tide of disease, death, and exile during the Great Famine. All told, the Great Famine lasted a decade, 1845 to 1855, and in a country of approximately 8 million people, around a million died, and around another million and a half got the fuck out forced into exile if they wanted to live, hoping to find refuge in places like Australia, Canada, and especially the United States. Uh, Still today, Ireland's highest recorded population was recorded back before the famine in 1841, 8.18 million. 40 years later, the population was 5.18 million, and by 1931, it was 4.21 million, roughly a 50% fucking drop in less than a century. That is crazy. Imagine half the people in your nation just leaving. I remember driving through Flint, Michigan around 2010 and seeing the most boarded up homes, you know, like per capita I had ever seen in my life. Decades of declining economic opportunities, residents fleeing to find jobs, left the city a a shell of its former self, right? The city was once around 200,000 people, only around 100,000 people were there at that time, most of them living in extreme poverty. That was Ireland as a whole nation. And then the initial Irish who left for the U.S. had no idea of knowing the prejudice that they would face there or the traits they'd acquired as a result of famine and mass starvation, how they would be mocked in the media as typically Irish, right? Oh, great. Uh, Another boat of broke-ass skinny gingers coming over and driving down the factory wage because those dumb motherfuckers will take any menial labor job they can get for half the wages of an American. Yeah, of course they will. They're fucking starving, literally. They weren't allowed to learn almost any trade. The famine and the hard years leading up to it had taught many of these Irish immigrants how to rely on social connections to survive, how to step outside the law to, to survive and make sure your family and loved ones got what they needed at any cost, right? How to be ruthless when you didn't know where your next meal was coming from or how rent was going to get paid. Would I have joined a gang under these circumstances or form one? Yeah, you know, but I've always had a cost risk analysis approach to the law. How much will I benefit from breaking the law compared to the likelihood I will get caught and get in trouble? How much trouble would I get? Uh, will I get in if caught? Right? I respect the need for laws so we can have civilization, but I always am aware that laws are passed by fallible men and women and that many laws passed throughout history and still today are completely immoral and or fucking ignorant. I'm guessing a lot of the Irish immigrants coming to America felt the same and were definitely a lot harder than my soft 21st century ass. And this combination of a lack of respect for the law, a hardness of character, it would serve Irish mobsters very, very well. The Irish would wind up in every major American city, but especially settled in the cities that uh, they arrived in first, crossing the Atlantic from Ireland, the cities closest to Ireland, like New York, Boston, Philadelphia. And so it will be the gangs that operated in these cities we will focus on today. Perhaps unsurprisingly, I hope unsurprisingly, uh, by the time the Irish arrived in the U.S., many of these cities had their own corrupt power, uh, political power structures like New York City's Tammany Hall, also known as the Society of St. Tammany, the Sons of St. Tammany, and uh, or the Columbian Order. Tammany Hall was a New York City political organization that endured for nearly two centuries. Formed in 1789 in opposition to the Federalist Party, its leadership often mirrored that of the local Democratic Party's executive committee. Although its popularity stemmed from a, a willingness to help the city's poor and immigrant populations, Tammany Hall also became known for charges of corruption levied against leaders such as William M. Boss Tweed. And in the late 19th century, when Irish immigrants were pouring into New York City by the hundreds of thousands, more Irish lived in New York than in Dublin by 1860, making it the largest Irish population in the world. By 1860, New York was home to 200,000 Irish, making up almost 25% of the city's total population. And at this time, Boss Tweed ran Tammany Hall and was on his way to becoming the third largest landowner in New York City a director of the Erie Railroad, a director of the 10th National Bank, a director of the New York Printing Company, the proprietor of the Metropolitan Hotel, a significant stockholder in iron mines and gas companies, 
a board member of the Harlem Gas Light Company, a board member of the Third Avenue Railway Company, board member of the Brooklyn Bridge Company, and president of the Guardian Savings Bank. And he was also corrupt as fuck. Tweed was convicted for stealing an amount estimated by an alderman's committee in 1877 at somewhere between $25 and $45 million from New York City from the taxpayers. Later estimates uh, will range as high as $200 million. Uh, He was a gangster more than he was a politician. And in many ways, he ran New York when the Irish started showing up during the famine. Tammany's decentralized organization enabled ward leaders to act as advocates for individuals when they had difficulties with the law. A criminal judge, for example, appointed or kept in office by Tammany Hall would have to listen carefully to a local ward leader asking for a suspended sentence in a particular case. What's more, Tammany Hall went straight to the top. Frequently, its leadership was identical to the executive committee of the local Democratic Party. And it was a major or controlling faction in the party from 1821 to 1872. And after a dip again from 1905 to 1932. And there was corruption, yes. But it was also very helpful to many. Right? And those Irish who had literally been starving, they didn't give a shit about corruption. Some early Irish immigrants uh, gained admittance to Tammany Hall in 1817. And the Irish thereafter never lost their ties with it. Irish members became precinct captains, ward bosses, aldermen. Injecting energy and imagination into elaborate into in elaborate ward system that dispensed favors and provided an edge in exchange for a vote. Tammany Hall was a lot like the mob. Tammany put forth candidates, mostly Democrats, under their banner, and the entire machine was well represented by the organization's official symbol, a ferocious Bengal tiger. And this would extend all over the country for a little while. In cities large and small, political machines dominated by first and second generation Irish Americans became a, a common mode of localized government. And these Irish Americans wouldn't have been able to do it without the support by many of the nation's other immigrant populations. Germans, Swedes, Poles, uh, Jews, Italians supported, even promoted Irish political leaders for a variety of reasons. And the Irish, many recognized a taste for politics that came from a culture based on social gatherings at the local saloon or the parish or both. The Irish culturally understood very well the craft of giving and receiving favors as the basis of a political system. Also, they did not shy away from and even seemed to relish the art of confrontation, which made them both good political leaders and good gangsters. And thus the Irish mob was born. Whereas the mafia, the Italian mafia, was a uh, private club, the Irish mob was more of a shared social contract characterized by a loosely connected sphere of influence that started with the lawmen at the top and ended with various street gangs at the bottom. These gangs were the muscle that lurked behind the symbol of the Tammany Tiger. Their unique skills most notably required on election day when all political parties, Democratic, Whig, Republican, other smaller groups, unleashed their so-called bully boys to police the polling sites. From gangs to high political office, men and women maneuvered for power, trying to gain a foothold in society and advance themselves by engaging in whatever was was required. Uh, Illegal gambling, prostitution, extortion, and so many other forms of corruption. This remained the model for organized crime in the U.S. until the years of prohibition, which changed everything. Prohibition provided something the underworld never had before, a single dominating racket that was so insanely profitable, it tipped the balance of power. With the establishment of illegal booze as an unprecedented source of profit and influence, the gangsters were now calling the shots, not the politicians. This represented the Irish mob's glory years. Gangs were making money from the sales of illegal alcohol and killing people to keep making that money, kind of exactly like Latin cartels do right now with cocaine. But don't legalize it. Don't get rid of 90% of that fucking violence. No, no, it's crazy talk. Drugs are bad. Nancy Reagan said so. And she was the smartest person America has ever produced. Anyway, many individual gangsters during Prohibition, Irish and otherwise, found themselves flush with influence and cash like they'd never seen before. Gang ties became closer, more organized, and the gangs themselves more profitable. And the racket extended far beyond the criminals. Across the country, an interconnected world, underworld, evolved to include not only mobsters and bootleggers, but also more politicians than ever before. And judges, lawyers, ward bosses, speakeasy operators, financiers, corporate overseers, police precinct captains, cops on the beat, corrupt federal agents, probably the father of a future president, etc., etc. Things began to change with the end of Prohibition in 1933. Loss of the massive alcohol revenue stream led to gang banging not making as much financial sense. And the Irish mob took an even greater hit during the years of FDR's New Deal. A number of prominent practitioners of machine politics were prosecuted or forced from office via corruption scandals. Political reforms were enacted that brought about an end to the long era of big, corrupt political machines. 
And then in the years following the world, uh, world War II, the Irish American gangster was scattered far and wide. Many were absorbed into the la labor movement, either as strike breakers uh, hired by corporations or as tough guys and facilitators connected with trade unions, most notably the International Longshoremen's Association and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Some Irish American gangsters became notorious hitmen for hire who carried out murder contracts, either for forces in the labor movement or for the Italian mafia, or both, whoever paid. The Italian mafia frequently employed Irish gunmen, particularly if the intended target of the hit was an Irishman. In fact, throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, lone Irish criminals for hire became pretty common. Think Scorsese's film The Irishman. Based on real-life Irish-American Teamsters official and suspected hitman Frank Sheeran, a guy who may have killed Jimmy Hoffa. Many working-class Irish who specialized in a specific brand of criminal activity, whether it was B&E's, breaking and entry, uh, safe cracking, the snatch racket, a.k.a. kidnapping, murder for hire, or body disposal, saw themselves as underworld tradesmen. Often these were men who wound up on the losing end of a long, ongoing rivalry between Irish and Italian mobsters. With a far larger and more organized structure, Italian organized crime groups inevitably dominated most of the confrontations from the Prohibition days onward, ditching and sometimes killing their Irish employees when they no longer served a purpose. Far more successful for the Irish were the neighborhood-based gangs that came to represent the last remnants of the Irish mob. These gangs, though flying much more under the radar, inherited criminal rackets from their Irish forefathers. And of course, with all of this, I'm making a, a fair amount of generalizations. While we look at the long history of the Irish mob in America, important to remember, you can't characterize everyone who operated within it in the same way. At the street level, there would be numerous figures who would come to represent the archetypal Irish gangster, desperate, doomed, untamed, shooting from the hip without much common sense to back up their violent actions. But plenty of other figures were community activists, organizers, people who above all were looking out for their fellow countrymen. Some of them were visionaries, men and women who may have become legendary venture capitalists if they hadn't ended up in the criminal underworld. And also some have been truly despicable people, sociopaths and sadists who embraced violence, not as a means to security, but as an end in itself. Now let's meet all kinds of interesting characters in today's Time Suck Timeline as I suck as much Irish mob history as one can in a few hours' time. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. We will begin in 1849. Why? Well, because that's where the dart stuck when I threw it at a board with a bunch of random dates on it. Or because this would be the year that 17 or 18-year-old future fucking legend John Morrissey would arrive in New York City from the upstate New York town of Troy, where he'd been raised after moving from Ireland there with his parents at the age of three. In Troy, Morrissey developed a reputation as one hell of a brawler and a troublemaker. He'd been indicted for burglary, assault, assault with intent to kill, served a 60-day stint in the county jail, and was under constant harassment from local authorities. As a teen, he became the leader of one of the city's downtown gangs who fought the uptown gangs, gained a reputation as a boxer able to lay a beat down on just about anybody. His fighting skills would serve him quite well later on in life. Feeling he was meant for greater things than a rivalry with local law enforcement in a smaller town, John left for the big city, 160 miles to the south. Morrissey knew exactly where he needed to go, the Empire Club a gambling parlor and political clubhouse that was famous throughout the state. Located on Park Row in Lower Manhattan, the club was the home base of Captain Isaiah Rinders, a legendary sporting man, gambling impresario, political fixer for the Democratic Party. Rinders was the employer of hundreds of political operatives, gambling club workers, saloon keepers, and gangsters. His organization had been at the heart of New York political machinery since the early 1840s. In 1844, Rinders achieved national fame for himself when he virtually delivered the presidency to James K. Polk, the Democratic candidate, just uh, by himself. Uh, John knew that's where he would have to go to climb the ranks. Uh, he arrived at the Empire Club on one June afternoon, stood overlooking the gaming tables, and just simply declared, I'm here to say I can lick any man in this place. Rinders himself was presiding at the gaming table that day, and uh, he called on a few of his men, violent gangsters, who proceeded to attack John. And young John fought several of them off with his, with his fists until a man named Big Tom Burns smacked him with a spittoon, knocking John the fuck out with a hard shot to the head. When he woke up, Rinders offered him a job working the docks, and John took it. The beating was worth it. Morrissey was put to work as an immigrant runner, one of hundreds who worked Castle Garden Wharf in Lower Manhattan, where the immigrant ships let out. Each day, he would watch the arrival of his countrymen 
and his heart would ache at what he saw. Having been born in Templemore County, Tipperary in 1831 and then raised in an Irish slum in America, he thought he knew poverty. In Troy, whenever his dad was able to find work, it had been at the local wallpaper factory, maybe the docks alongside other Irish laborers, and he struggled to provide for John as well as his seven sisters. But what John saw at Castle Garden made him reassess his thoughts on poverty. He realized things could get a whole lot worse. Gaunt, haunted, starving Irish peasants arrived by the boatload, weak from dropsy and gout and scurvy and more, clinging with emaciated arms to satchels that contained everything they owned. They told shocking tales of the Great Famine that had ravaged the old country over the last few years and of the horrific, disease-ridden journey across the ocean in hopes of a better future. Morrissey's job was to greet the new arrivals, send them to, uh, send them to some soup kitchens and boarding houses owned and controlled by renters. They'd be given a, a much-needed helping hand, And then later, when it came time to vote, they would be expected to vote exactly as they were instructed. It was very much a I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine deal. This position, of course, towed the line between charity and exploitation. On election day, it was Morrissey's job also to see to it that these immigrants voted the way he told them to and to threaten or carry out violence if necessary when they didn't. While he worked as a runner, Morrissey found lodging in five points. Man, this place. An infamous slum neighborhood that dominated the Sixth Ward of the lower tip of Manhattan. Five Points was a lively area, uh, though the physical conditions of the district were fucking awful. Laid out on top of what had once been a sewage pond, known as the Collect. Five Points had evolved from being uh, mostly an industrial district of tanneries, glue factories, turpentine distilleries, to a residential haven for the city's growing and often fucking rowdy new immigrant class. It got its name from the layout of the streets. Uh, Five Points was where Canal Street, the Bowery, uh, Chatham, Pearl and Center Streets converged to form a truncated triangle. In the middle of the triangle was Paradise Square, which was claimed by the earliest of the area's street gangs, mostly Irish, including the 40 Thieves, Kerry Onions, Shirt Tails, Chichesters, Patsy Conroys, Plug Uglies, Roach Guard, and Dead Rabbits. And all that sounds like a, uh, a good lineup. Some Friday night for some punk rock show and some dirty, poorly lit bar selling mostly cans at Cheap Pilsner. Uh, there actually is a post-hardcore metal band called Dead Rabbits. Surprisingly, it doesn't seem to be a band named Roach Guard or Carrie Onions, Patsy Conroy's, or Chichester's. Uh, but there was an 80s punk band called Plug Uglies, and there was a new metal band called The 40 Thieves. And finally, there's even a little garage band out of the UK that may or may not still be around called The Shirt Tales. Uh, the other early staging area outside of Paradise Square for these first Irish gangs was the Bowery, which extended north of Five Points. Also north of Five Points were the social clubs and headquarters of the native-born American gangs, most notably the Bowery Boys, the True Blue Americans, and the American Guard. The most infamous building in Five Points was the Old Brewery. The Old Brewery was a former beer factory that had been converted into living quarters, a five-story monstrosity. The building mostly housed an impoverished collection of newly arrived immigrants and freed African Americans. And for less than two bucks a month, lodgers would reside in conditions that were stifling, overcrowded, and with a sanitation system so haphazard that the building and surrounding area were sometimes subject to waves of cholera. It was a literal shit show. Sorry, I guess this week's suck does feature some poop in it, but no one was eating the poop in five points I'm aware of. In the old brewery sprawling basement, known locally as the Den of Thieves, also the name of a former rock band from the 90s, gambling, organized dogfights, prostitution, all mannery, uh, mannery, all manner of robbery, there we go, and assault were not uncommon. Uh, For local authorities, be they police or officials of the Association for Improving the Conditions of the Poor, the old brewery was a virtual no-go zone. The belief was that if you entered uninvited, you were taking a real risk of never entering anywhere else again, ever. Violent crimes like rape and murder were said to be frequent in the building's long and twisted hallways, and that violence bled out onto the surrounding streets, creating a local atmosphere of depravity. There was a saloon or speakeasy on nearly every corner, What a fucking place to be a bartender. With drunks stumbling out into the streets to be jack-rolled by gangs of prepubescent hooligans, if not confronted by former members of these gangs, now part of local big boy gangs. This whole situation sounds fucking terrible. I feel like, uh, well, I want to say if I was there, I'd be a part of the brawls. A real badass. I'd probably hole up in my apartment trying to find a good reason not to just throw myself off the fucking roof and get it over with. Organized thievery was also, of course, common with a high concentration of pickpockets, sneak thieves, con artists, working in little groups that could be called gangs, even if they didn't have a name. At night, practically every other tenement was set up as a brothel. The district was so infamous that Charles Dickens visited, very briefly, in the mid-20th century, and wrote the following about it. 
Let us go again and plunge into five points. Poverty, wretchedness, and vice are rife enough where we are going now. This is the place these narrow ways diverging to the right and left and reeking everywhere with dirt and filth. Debauchery has made the very houses prematurely old. See how the rotten beams are tumbling down and how the patched and broken windows seem to scowl dimly like eyes that have been hurt in drunken frays. Vapors issue forth that blind and suffocate. From every corner, as you glance about you in these dark streets, some figure crawls half-awakened, as if judgment hour were near at hand. Here, too, are lanes and alleys paved with mud knee-deep, underground chambers where they dance and game, ruined houses open to the street, whence through wide gaps in the walls other ruins loom upon the eye, as though the world of vice and misery had nothing else to show. Hideous tenements, which take their names from robbery and murder, all that is loathsome, drooping, and decayed, is here. Sounds again horrific. But, random thought, I bet some really hot sex also went down there. I mean, come on. Hot, drunken sex where you're young and the physical prime, the world has gone mad, you don't know how the fuck your future is going to work out or if it's going to work out on any level if you're going to be around in a week and you fuck like it's your last night on earth. Hail Lucifina, allowing us divine pleasure even in the darkest of times. Uh, this place would be John Morrissey's new home base, the place where he would begin to thrive. He'd already had experience in Troy, leading a an old gang, right, the, the downtowns who battled with the anti-immigrant uptowns on the regular. But his street fighting ways wouldn't be enough here. Well, it, his fists alone wouldn't be enough. He'd have to learn how to use the five points weapons of choice. And this is preposterous. Hatchets, right, so axes. Knives, spiked clubs, right, big uh, fucking wooden clubs, like think a baseball bat with a bunch of heavy nails sticking, uh, sticking out of it. Brass knuckles, fucking tomahawks. Muskets and more. Shit was vicious. You had to be a rugged motherfucker to survive these battles, let alone dominate them. All of these weapons were being wielded by vicious, battle-hardened gang members. By 1850, when John Morrissey began living on Cherry Street, the gangs had begun to cl uh, claim various streets and territories as their own. Some of the gangs identified themselves with special clothes or colors. The Plug Uglies wore high-top derbies stuffed with padding so they could use their noggins as battering rams. It's fun. The shirt tails wore their shirts untucked, so, you know, name makes sense. The dead rabbits hung dead rotting rabbits from their necks uh, so they wouldn't be confused with anyone else. Uh, no, they sewed distinctive red stripes down the outer seam of their pants to distinguish themselves from the roach guard who would wear blue stripes. For many of the newly arrived Irish who had been oppressed by the British for centuries, belonging to these gangs was like belonging to a, a noble house. Everyone knew who you were from the colors you wore. Some real Game of Thrones shit. One of these gangs could have anywhere between less than 10 or a hundred or more members. The largest of the gangs during John's early New York days was the Dead Rabbits, a conglomeration of numerous former Paradise Square gangs who'd come together to fight under one banner. Some said that the gang's name derived from the fact that they once actually did carry a dead rabbit impaled on a stick as a calling card. Maybe. More likely the gang's name came from the Gaelic, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm sure, a Dead Rabid. At the vernacular of the times, dead was an intensifier that meant very. And uh, Rabid uh, in Gaelic, and again, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, uh, was a galoot or big lug, a.k.a. a clumsy or oafish person. Thus, a dead rabbit was a very big galoot. The dead rabbits had no real leader. Think the Bloods and Crips, not long after they first formed, as opposed to the highly organized Italian mafia family. Uh, they were broken down into subdivisions and spread throughout the Five Points District. By far, the most famous gang battles were those fought between the dead rabbits and the Bowery Boys. But there were also smaller fights between factions of the 40 Thieves, Plug Uglies, True Blue Americans, and more. Some of these, uh, you know, riots were territorial in nature. Many were also racially charged, and they were fucking massive. A big old anti-Irish gang fighting a big Irish gang. So many very big galoots duking it out. Sometimes gang riots raged sporadically for two to three days at a time, with the streets barricaded by barrels and carts while gangsters blazed away with muskets and pistols, or often tussled up close with brickbats, bludgeons, fists, feet, or their teeth. Uh, brickbats, a moment on brickbats. That is, it, they're terrifying. It's a very simple, horrifying weapon. You just take a big piece of a brick, right? Just think a big old rock and you put it in a sock or some other piece of cloth or whatnot and swing it around so you can bash someone's fucking face in. Uh, maybe not more terrifying than being hit with a hatchet or a spiked club, but still very terrifying. All this back in the days before antibiotics, modern painkillers, urgent care, cosmetic surgery, so much fun. Uh, most of the combatants were men, but women also played a role, either as lookouts or as resuppliers of ammunition in these battles. A few women 
also achieved renown as fierce battlers themselves. None more so than Hellcat Maggie, who allegedly fought alongside the dead rabbits in many of their biggest battles with the Bowery Boys and other nativist gangs. Um, young woman, no more than 20 years old, Hellcat Maggie is reported to have literally filed her teeth sharp as many daggers and wore on her fingers long artificial nails made out of metal. She would descend on a rival gang member like a screaming banshee, biting, clawing till her fingers were dripping with the blood of her enemy. Real name, not known. She was thought to have suffered a violent death at the age of 25, and she scares shit out of me. She shows up in Martin Scorsese's 2002 movie about this place in time, Gangs of New York. Uh, you can now actually buy an Irish whiskey called Hellcat Maggie. A uh, great name. She may be nothing more than a myth or an amalgamation of uh, several real historical figures, but myth or not, there were a few women fighting uh, their asses off in these brutal gangs. Casualties from these gang battles could number in the hundreds. Frequently, the destruction and carnage required calling in the National Guard to restore order. When gang members died, they were quickly replenished with new immigrants who had just arrived and were seeking protection. Now let's reconnect with Street Fight and John. Uh, by mid-1851, John Morrissey had established himself as a young man on the move. Uh, through his activities as an immigrant runner and as a political organizer for Captain Isaiah Rinder's Empire Club, he had cobbled together a small financial nest egg that made it possible for him to buy in as a part owner of the Gem Saloon. It was here he would begin to pursue his own political ambitions. And not knowing how to read or write, this is where he learned both in the saloon's back room. He also began a professional boxing career, traveling as far as California at one point, clear across the country for bare-knuckle prize fights. And he was an avid gambler. After winning a fight at Boston Corners and being declared uh, the new champion of America in 1853 as a heavyweight uh, bare-knuckle boxer, uh, Morrissey returned to five points as the people's champion and married Sarah, Sarah Smith. He invested his boxing proceeds in a number of gambling establishments, one of which, a Faro and roulette parlor located at number eight Barclay Street, became especially popular amongst politicians and sporting men, as they were called, gamblers. A more downscale gambling den owned by Morrissey was located near Paradise Square. That was frequented by members of the Dead Rabbits. Increasingly, Morrissey's circle of friends spanned two worlds, rich and poor, street hoodlums, and connected politicians. And then, one, and then on the night of July 26, 1854, Morrissey came face-to-face with another very scary motherfucker, William Poole, a notorious former Bowery boy who now presided over his own gang, the Poole Association. Poole was a butcher by trade, very skilled with knives, As a member of the anti-Irish Bowery Boys, he'd been in a number of gang wars with the Dead Rabbits and the Roach Guard, and according to rumors, he had sliced more than a couple guys up. He was over six feet tall, when that was a lot less common than it is now, strong as a bull, and he was known as Bill the Butcher. Daniel Day-Lewis played him in Gangs of New York, and that's a fucking fantastic film, if you have not seen it. Daniel Day-Lewis plays such a memorable psychopath. I got lost in highlights for a while. One of the greatest villains I've ever seen on the big screen. Uh, Watching clips of his performance still gives me the chills. Uh, One of the greatest actors ever. Uh, In recent months, Bill the Butcher, the real one, had emerged as a popular representative of the Know Nothing Party, a political organization that started as a secret anti-immigrant underground network which burned Catholic churches and assassinated immigrant leaders. In the wake of the Irish potato famine, the Know Nothing movement rode a wave of racist, slanderous, anti-Irish sentiment that had roots earlier in the century. In the U.S., no Irish need apply was a sentiment expressed by American-born employers, pretty commonly, going back at least until the 1830s, or at least as far as the 1830s. Uh, The prejudice was partially religious-based, with anti-immigrant politicians claiming that Catholics' allegiance would be to the Pope and not to the country, something that would still get leveled at John uh, John F. Kennedy over a century later when he ran in the 1960 presidential election. Uh, Makes me think of more recent Mitt Romney sentiment, fear he'd be more loyal to the LDS church than to America. Uh, In addition to anti-Catholic sentiment, there were also racial stereotypes at work. The Irish were seen as ignorant, anti-authoritarian, clannish, rowdy, and primitive. In newspaper editorial cartoons in Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, and New York, the Irish were routinely depicted as racial others, as inferiors. One famous cartoonist, Thomas Thomas Nast, even established a thriving mini-career lampooning Paddy, whose pug-nosed, slovenly representation was often placed alongside Sambo, the ignorant rural black caricature. Both Patty and Sambo personified, to many, the two racial and cultural threats to the waspy ruling order. By the time Bill the Butcher had begun to distinguish himself as a gangster, the know-nothings were the shock troops of a so-called American purification movement. Among other things, the official know-nothing charter listed their principles as anti-Romanism, anti-Bedonism, anti-Papistolism, 
anti-nunneryism, anti-winking Virginiaism, and anti-Jesuitism. Uh, winking Virginiaism, no fucking clue what that means. A uh, little joke at the time, maybe, that was lost to history. Uh, the butcher was a hero of the anti-immigration movement, and Morrissey was the hero of the other side when they first met. Those two forces came head to head on the night of July 26, 1854, when Morrissey found the butcher drinking at the bar of the City Hotel at Broadway and Howard Street. Morrissey challenged Poole to a boxing match. The two men would agree to meet the following morning at the Amos Street Dock, now Christopher Street. As later described in the Police Gazette, this encounter was fucking legendary. It reads, The fight began with some light sparring, Poole holding himself principally on the defensive as his opponent circled for a chance to close. For about five minutes, this child's play of the Giants lasted. Then Morrissey made a rush, but Poole was too quick for him. As old Smoke made his lunge, Bill the Butcher ducked with remarkable agility and seized him by the ankles. In a flash, Poole threw his opponent clean over his head. And as old Smoke went sprawling, he only had time to roll over when Poole pounced on him like a tiger. Then followed terrible minutes of fighting. There was a long gash in Poole's cheeks where the flesh had been torn by his opponent's teeth. The blood was streaming from both of Morrissey's eyes. Not a hand was raised to interfere or favor either contestant during the two or three minutes this struggle lasted, and then the fight would end in a draw. Two fucking bears going head to head. This would have been uh, quite the fight to watch. It would have been like UFC if the only rule was no weapons. Uh, These two tough guys would continue being rivals for just over half a year until the night of February 25th, 1855, when two of Morrissey's henchmen gunned down Bill the Butcher at Stanwick's Hall. Uh, The real butcher's death. Not quite as dramatic as the Leonardo DiCaprio movie version. Uh, Before I continue, a word about Old Smoke. Uh, By the time of this fight, Old Smoke was the nickname Morrissey had been known as likely for a few years. And how he got this nickname uh, is even fucking crazier than what you just heard. A more legendary fight. During a fight with Thomas McCann, another noted rough and tumble fighter, Morrissey was said to have been pinned on his back atop burning coals (laughs) from a stove that had been overturned during the brawl. And then Morrissey endured the pain of having his fucking flesh burned off his body only to go full Hulk, fight off McCann enough to get back on his feet, then beat McCann within an inch of his life as smoke from his burning flesh literally was rising up from his back. This guy was no fucking joke. Following the murder of Bill DeButcher, John Morrissey, along with Pa Dean, McLaughlin, Lou Baker, and Jim Turner, a few other minor gangsters, they were all put on trial for his murder. The case resulted in a series of hung juries before charges were dropped altogether. Guessing Old Smoke and his buddies might have gotten to the jury members. Made it very clear to them that a guilty verdict would equal their death. Irish-American John Old Smoke Morrissey was now the most popular and notorious man in all of New York's underworld, but still not the most powerful. Over the next years, he would shore up power and influence, paying attention but not acting, as the Irish clamored for the leader of the mob to be one of their own. The current leader was still Rinders, and he was not Irish. The need for a strong leader was important. During these years, the city's gang wars were growing worse and worse due to the fact that New York was patrolled by two competing police forces. The municipals, who were loyal to the Democratic Party and more pro-Irish, and the Metropolitans, stepchild of the Republicans and more anti-Irish. So weird uh, that they had these two competing police forces. These forces seemed more interested in fighting each other than actually policing the city. So meanwhile, gangs got free license to brawl as much as they wanted. And then all of this would come to a head. July 4th, 1857, Independence Day. That evening, a large contingent of dead rabbits and roach guards attacked the clubhouse of both the Bowery Boys and the Atlantic Guard at 42 Bowery. An all-night battle raged, and the police did nothing. The next day, the gang war continued, with literally hundreds of soldiers on each side. Uh, Brickbats, stones, and clubs were flying thickly around, reported the New York Times. Fucking brickbats! Uh, The times continued. Men ran wildly about brandishing firearms. Wounded men lay on the sidewalk and were trampled upon. Now the rabbits would make a combined rush and force their antagonist up Baird Street to the Bowery. Then the fugitives being reinforced would turn on their pursuers and compel a retreat. Police finally arrived on the scene using uh, their clubs to force scores of dead rabbits and Bowery boys into tenements. One fleeing gangster was knocked off the roof of a house at Baxter Street. His skull was fractured when he hit the sidewalk. And then his gang enemies promptly if he was even still alive, made sure to stomp him to death. It was mayhem. Eventually, the police called in Isaiah Renders. He would arrive on the scene on July 5th, right, uh, you know, later this day, uh, employ the the gangs to end the violence, and in return, he would just get a bunch of rocks thrown at him. So Renders had influence, but he did not control the Irish. That was clear now. He was not the mob boss he thought he was. Within about an hour after he spoke, though, 8 p.m., the riot does finally end. Eight men were known to have been killed during the riots, 
with uh, likely around 100 injured. And now with Renders exposed as not having the influence he thought he did, the Irish turned to their new leader, John Old Smoke Morrissey. Nothing is over. You just don't turn it off. Sorry, all that machismo just gave me a little Rambo flashback from last week. Uh, Morrissey's first order of business was to expand his gambling empire. In the 19th century, gambling fueled the entire underworld, as well as upper world politicians who relied on money and muscle provided by gambling operators. Morrissey ran two kinds of establishments, gambling dens for the poor, which consisted mostly of card games, craps, a few other games of the day, and upscale parlors for the rich who favored faro, uh, bagatelle, and roulette. Meanwhile, the recent riots increased anti-Irish sentiment in the U.S. Cartoonists now depicted the Irish as grotesque ape-like creatures, uh, dumb, lawless brutes, and the depictions of their dress, public behavior, custom, and physical appearance. The Irish poor in particular were portrayed as a dangerous race. Elite New Yorker George Templeton Strong would observe in his famous diary, our Celtic fellow citizens are almost as remote from us in temperament and constitution as the Chinese. All right, uh, pretty cringy. Uh, not sure Morrissey really gave a fuck about dudes like uh, New York socialite and rich kid George Templeton Strong. He was building an empire. He uh, next opened a gambling parlor in nearby Saratoga Springs and became a high society figure himself. Started dressing the part. He grew a full black beard, wore sparkling jewelry, a studded uh, cravat, diamond rings, gold pocket watch, wore striped high-waisted pants, uh, combined with a swallowtail jacket and a beaver pelt overcoat, overcoat, excuse me, topped off with a mink bowler hat. Just want to let you sit with that visual for a second. And imagine a guy dressed like that at some fancy high-end restaurant or opera house or whatnot, feeling insulted, and then not even bothering to take off his jacket or jewelry, and then maybe just brick batting the shit out of you. I picture him wearing a monocle and just pounding my face in without breaking a sweat or having the monocle fall out. Uh, while Morrissey set the stage for how rags to riches gangsters would uh, appear for the next century, roughly, he also rubbed shoulders with the elite. But when Morrissey tired, uh, tried to buy a house in the expensive, aristocratic part of town, a group banded together and, brought, and bought it out from under him. Still didn't want the Irish in town, rich or not. Man, those fuckers were lucky to live after that. Uh, Morrissey would not be deterred by the slight. In 1868, he used his clout to get himself elected to U.S. Congress. Two years later, he'd be reelected in an overwhelming majority. Meanwhile, like we said in the intro, Irish mobsters continued to work their way up the ranks of Tammany Hall. And the man who presided over Tammany Hall beginning in 1863 was the notorious Boss Tweed, a.k.a. William Marcy Tweed, whom uh, Morrissey endorsed, providing him with the Irish Catholic vote. Tweed was not Irish, but he was uh, third generation Scottish. Right? And since the Scottish had also been oppressed by the Irish, I guess he was uh, considered close enough. Until 1871, the boss and the ring of gangsters who supported him controlling the levers of power by determining who would and who would not be elected to office. They did so largely through uh, use of thuggery and terror on election day. Once in office, Tweed's ring got rich through control of the municipal government, the county government, the judicial system, uh, the governorship, the all-important board of audit, which supervised city and county expenditures. Under Tweed, the Irish benefited greatly, holding down key positions as ward committeemen war bosses and precinct captains. But, you know, then, as I mentioned earlier, it would all come crumbling down. A series of damning, art, damning articles in the New York Times brought on by Tweed building his own massive Victorian-style courthouse finally turned the tide of public opinion against him. Back-to-back indictments showed that Tweed had stolen $6 million in funds. It was alleged that the boss and his ring together had defrauded the municipal government out of 45 maybe even $50 million. Estimated later, as I mentioned, at up to $200 million. Facing major prison time, Tweed went on the lam, eventually made it to Spain, where he was caught, and then extradited to the U.S., where he would languish behind bars. Then as part of a plea arrangement, Tweed eventually came clean, and in 1877, during an investigation of the Tweed ring by the board of aldermen, this boss turned on John Old Smoke Morrissey. In a long written statement, the disgraced Tammany boss identified Morrissey as a skillful practitioner of mass voter fraud and a bag man for the ring. Furthermore, declared Tweed, Morrissey was a proprietor and owner of the worst places in the city of New York, the resort of thieves and persons of the lowest character. Perhaps one of the worst faults that can be attributed to me is having been the means of keeping his gambling houses protected from the police. Morrissey's leadership position amongst the city's Irish movers and shakers was now quickly taken over by a rival, Honest John Kelly, another Irishman. Old Smoke then broke from Tammany and tried to create his own organization called Young Democracy, even though he was elected to the state Senate in 1875 and re-elected two years later, his health deteriorated due to alcoholism and dementia, and he was never able to reclaim his previous position of power. 
On May 1st, 1877, after being bedridden for weeks, John Morrissey died of pneumonia. He was only 47. The man who had helped to create the criminal framework for the Irish in America was gone, but he had showed future generations that by combining criminal know-how with political influence, a man could take on the world even if he was born with nothing. By the 1880s now, the squalid slum conditions that had given rise to an earlier generation of dead rabbits and plug uglies had not changed much. In five points, the old brewery had been torn down with all traces of its sordid past eradicated, but tenement life had become even more stifling and it spread well beyond the bounds of the Sixth War. Uh, with nearly 33,000 densely crowded tenement houses on the Lower East Side, that's insane. Children had little choice but to lead their lives mostly in the street. A pack mentality ruled. Famed photojournalist Jacob A. Reese would write of what he witnessed. Every corner has its gang, not always on the best of terms with the rivals on the next block, but all with a common program, defiance of law and order, and with a common ambition, to get pinched, i.e. arrested, so as to pose as heroes before their fellows. A successful raid on a grocer's till is a good mark. Doing up a policeman is cause for promotion. The gang is an institution in New York. Reese would argue that gang life was simply a condition of living in such squalid housing, writing, The gang is the ripe fruit of tenement house growth. It was born there, endowed with a heritage of instinctive hostility to restraint by a generation that sacrificed home to freedom, or left his country for country's good, for its country's good. The tenement received and nursed the seed. New York's tough represents the essence of reaction against the old and the new oppression. Nursed in the rank soil of the slums, its gangs are made of the American-born sons of English, Irish, and German parents. They reflect exactly the conditions of the tenements from which they sprang. Man, environment! Such a powerful influencer of character, right? How can it not be? How much easier is it to live a so-called good and successful life if you're born in a nice affluent home in some safe suburb to two loving and stable parents than it is to build that same life when you're raised in the tenements or the ghetto? No real difference, right? Growing up in a broken home or at least an extremely impoverished one around human wolves and cheap and frequent death. In the years following John Morrissey's death in 1878 to the end of the century, the Wyos were now by far the most notorious gang in New York. Uh, Wyos also the name of a band, rockabilly band from the 80s. Like the Dead Rabbits before them, the Irish Wyos were a conglomeration of numerous smaller street corner crews who, according to Reese, met in club rooms, generally a tenement, sometimes under a pier or dump, to carouse, play cards, and plan their raids, their fences, who dispose of the stolen property. Uh, since the city was now a fully a quarter Irish, those former anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant groups had simply been overwhelmed. Now no one was strong enough to stand up to them. The YOs thus were less of a protection organization and more of a criminal commercial enterprise. They existed for plunder and profit alone. They were led for years by the two Dannys, Danny Lyons and Danny Driscoll and they presided over a sprawling domain that seemed to take in most of lower Manhattan. Danny Lyons was a pimp who often strolled the streets of the Sixth Ward with his girls. He had an ability to bring girls into the fold that was unprecedented, which probably extended to getting men to join the YOs too. Their membership, almost all of whom had nicknames, a common feature of the gangs in general, included Red Rocks Feral, Googie Corcoran, <laughs> Googie, old Googie, uh, Bull Hurley, Hoggy Walsh, Slops Connolly, <laughs> and Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. Maybe not Derek, but the rest of those were real nicknames and actually better than Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. I like fucking Slops Hoggy and Googie. Uh, Piker Ryan, another Waihu, who helped make the gang famous, achieved a kind of immortality when he was arrested with a gangster price list in his pocket that was published in the Police Gazette, right? A little newspaper around the city. <laughs> this is great. Punching, $2. Both eyes blacked, $4. Nose and jaw broke. $10, jacked out, which is to be knocked out with a blackjack, $15. <laughs> or if you don't want to like knock somebody out with a blackjack, you can pay the same amount to get somebody's ear chawed off. Uh, leg or arm broke, $19. Shot in leg, $25. Stab, $25. Doing the big job, obviously murder, $100 and up. Man, couple thoughts here. First, how is, how is it cheaper to pay this guy to chew someone's ear off than it was to have him break somebody's arm? I mean, I do get that it was harder back then to recover from a broken arm than it is now, but simple fractures of the arm were actually relatively easy to fix back in the 19th century, right? Uh, having your ear chewed off, tough to repair that now. Impossible back then. You're just down an ear for the rest of your life. 
Also, why was chewing someone's fucking ear off common back then? I mean, I mean, the rest of that shit is fairly typical street fight stuff. You know, knocking somebody out, blacking their eyes, breaking their legs, arm. But chewing an ear off just seems like another level. And, and finally, why wasn't there an option to, to black just one eye? Why did you have to pay someone to blacken both of someone's eyes or none of their eyes? I feel like asking Pike or Ryan any of these questions would at least get me punched. If I annoyed him so much, he felt like he had to punch me. I wonder if I'd have to pay him two bucks. And I feel like asking him that question would probably get my arm broke or my ear chewed off. Uh, the Wyos were now more like we now. Uh, the Wyos were more like what we now think of as the mob, right, than their predecessors. Uh, they collected tribute payments from saloon keepers and shop owners in the area in return for protection. You know that is not getting robbed by competing gangs or being robbed by the Wyos themselves. A crime known as racketeering. Racketeering takes its name from the word racket, which was a public function like a party or a dance that criminals would hold under the guise of being a fundraiser for a worthy cause. Uh, racketeering was one example of how the underworld had become much more organized and, stratify- and stratified thanks to pioneers like John Morrissey. So how was uh, it organized? One way to think of it would be like baseball. The neighborhood street gangs represented the minor leagues where an enterprising young hoodlum could establish a reputation, show his stuff, attract the attention of some uh, big league scouts. If a gangster distinguished himself at the street level, he could advance to the majors, become a mobster which was a position much more closely connected to the, uh, you know, le- levers of political and economic power in the city. If the mobster was really good, he could play for Tammany Hall, like the New York Yankees. And within Tammany Hall, he could become an all-star, get filthy rich, even if he were truly gifted, make it to the mobster hall of fame like John Old Smoke Morrissey. Uh, the baseball metaphor extends if you think about the kind of notoriety Irish mobsters got, sort of its own celebrity status. In fact, by the 1880s, Irish gangs in general had become so notorious, they achieved a kind of mythical status in the press. You could be the Babe Ruth or the Lou Gehrig of the underworld. Kind of like Capone, you know, Scarface would be decades later for the Italian mafia. In Manhattan, most of the city's broadsheets had a daily common that covered the criminal courts and another called the police blotter that relayed arrest reports on the previous night's criminal activity. And the columns paid a lot of special attention to the gangs. Another gang was the Daybreak Boys. To join them, you had to kill somebody. There was also the Hudson Dusters, the Gas House Gang, the Parlor Mob, and the Goofers. <laughs> the Goofers, uh, born in Hell's Kitchen, a burgeoning slum on Manhattan's west side. But above these and other local gangs in the 1880s, the Irish Wyos reigned supreme. And let's check, check back in with their leaders now, the two Dannys. Started with Danny Lyons. Like we said, he was a pimp. One day, he happened to recruit a girl who left her boyfriend to join his group in Paradise Square. Uh, this boyfriend would declare that Daniel Lyons was going to fucking pay for his deeds. Some accounts say the boyfriend attacked Lyons. Others say he didn't. Just, you know, just said like, basically confronted him verbally. Uh, what is not disputed is that Lyons pulled out a revolver, proceeded to shoot the boyfriend in the middle of Paradise Square. Immediately afterwards, he went in the lamb. His brothel, op- his brothel operation then struggled without a manager. Uh, two of his prostitutes would end up getting in a scuffle that ended with one of them stabbing the other in the throat with a fucking cheese knife. Shortly thereafter, Lyons was captured and put on trial. Though all the evidence pointed to the fact that he was defending himself in the shooting... As a leader of the Wyo gang, uh, he didn't have a chance with the jury. Guess he uh, couldn't get to them the way that Old Smoke could. He was found guilty of murder, sentenced to death. Around the same time, Danny Driscoll, the other leader of the Wyos, who would also be put on trial for murder when he accidentally shot a young prostitute while uh, trying to kill a rival gang's member, was sentenced to death. Neither one of these dudes had quite the clout or the love of the people as Old Smoke. At 7.15 on the morning of January 23rd, 1888, Driscoll was led to the gallows, and his last words were... May God have mercy on my soul. 7.42 a.m., he was executed. Uh, 300 pounds of iron jerked him three feet into the air. The rope snapped his neck like a twig. Eight months later, the other Danny was led down the same hallway to the same gallows. Rope was placed around his neck, trap door dropped open. Lines bucked and kicked for a few seconds, and then he was gone. A reporter for the Brooklyn Eagle would observe, so far as a hanging can be good, it was good hanging. All right. Uh, now a new leader needed to command the Wyos, and that man would be a rising underworld star named Timothy Daniel Sullivan, a.k.a. Big Tim. Uh, Sullivan owned a saloon on Christie Street that the now two dead Dannys had frequented. He was born in Five Points, July 23rd, 1863, putting him in his mid-20s at the time of his ascent. He'd grown up in a rundown tenement apartment with his mom, six siblings, stepdad, three boarders, all occupying one tiny apartment. Yeah. As a young man, he worked as a newspaper delivery boy, which allowed him to develop a network of contacts. He'd form his first business by giving orphans and runaways their first stack of papers free in exchange for their loyalty, and it worked, and he began to climb the business ladder. 
By the age of 23, as a result of his popularity in the ward, Sullivan was put forth as a candidate for state assembly. Despite his youth and inexperience, he won by a landslide. On the night of his victory, a large crowd gathered at his campaign headquarters on the Bowery and chanted loudly, Hurrah for Big Tim! Hurrah for the big fella! Nobody was better at securing votes than Big Tim. Why don't we do more hurrahs now? You don't hear anybody hurrah anymore. You know, you do something nice. Hurrah! You know, I used to do that. You know, Logan uh, designed a, a shirt that I especially, you know, love with just like with both hands. Hurrah for Logan! Hurrah for Logan! Just a little chance. You know, Tyler does uh, some great fucking video for social media. Hurrah for Tyler! Not enough hurrahs. Uh, nobody was better at securing votes than Big Tim. In a speech delivered on behalf of a recently elected alderman, he explained his technique of altering a hoodlum's appearance so that he could vote multiple times undetected. He said, uh, when they vote with their whiskers on, you take them to a barber, scrape off the chin fringe, then you vote them again with the side lilacs and a mustache. Then to the barber again, off come the sides. You vote them a third time with just a mustache. If that ain't enough, and the box can stand a few more ballots, clean off the mustache, vote them plain face. That makes every one of them good for four votes. Ah, the good old days of uh, voter fraud. A bit harder to do now, it seems, despite the claims of some. Uh, By the beginning of the 1890s, Big Tim Sullivan had effectively taken the position that John Morrissey had left. Beloved captain of the Irish mob. But there was a new challenge to the Irish mob's mob's preeminence, more immigrants. Now, instead of the Irish arriving by the boatloads, it was the Italians. Mamma mia, rigatoni, marinara, alfredo, maserati. Like the Irish before them, these immigrants came with little more than the clothes on their backs. Between 1880 and 1924, more than 4 million Italians immigrated to the U.S., with the majority fleeing grinding rural poverty in southern Italy and Sicily. Wars, a massive earthquake, a drought, disease decimating Italian vineyards, uh, and more all combined to lead to millions of Italians, including hundreds of thousands of Sicilians, facing some of the same hardships the Irish had faced. Unlike the Irish, some of these immigrants brought a criminal tradition of commerce and respect rooted in the villages of Sicily. Uh, This was the beginnings of the American-Italian Mafia. The Sicilian version in America would come to be known as Casa Nostra, Our Thing, and would be comprised of friends who had to be Italian-born and friends of friends extended business associates who could be non-Italian. The mafiosi uh, even had their own version of racketeering, which in Sicilian was called Pizu. Defined literally, Pizu meant the beak of a small bird, such as a canary or a lark. Back in Sicily, when the Mafia Don referred to a very vaganeri a piso, a.k.a. wetting the beak, he was talking about the same system of tribute that already existed in the Irish mob. In many ways, the power struggle between the Irish and Italian mobs would come to define the criminal underworld for the next century. Interestingly, uh, the kind of opening shots in this war would take place not in New York City or Chicago, but in New Orleans. I love it. I was working at NOLA, ahead of my stand-up show there when going over this section of notes. Late in the night of October 15th, 1890, on his way home from work, New Orleans Police Superintendent David C. Hennessy was killed by a band of unknown assailants. Before that, in his years as a lawman, Hennessy had established a reputation as a fearless crime fighter. He was especially well known as the man who had almost single-handedly taken on the Sicilian Mafia. A hail of bullets ripped through him, leaving him dead in the streets as he tried to pursue his attackers. News of the assassination caused ripples all over town. Hennessy was idolized by the city's Irish population. He had been one of their own. Seemed like a straightforward story of a hero being gunned down in his prime by a gang of criminals, but it wasn't that simple. He was actually in cahoots with the Provenzano mob family, and this was not uncommon for local police. Since at least 1874, when the hated Metropolitan Police Force was ousted during an armed coup and a city-run department was instituted in its place, cops in New Orleans were the lowest paid of any big city police force in the entire U.S., which gave them a lot of incentive to take bribes and pick up extra work. They frequently hired themselves out to be security guards, private detectives, or even guns for hire, even to the mafia. And Hennessy allegedly went into business with the Provenzano brothers and became a part owner of a popular bordello called the Red Lantern Club, located near Hennessy's home in a part of the French Quarter known as the Swamp at that time. But there were those who didn't appreciate this, the rival Italian family in the area, the Matranga uh, mob. Uh, On the night he was killed, Hennessy was weeks away from testifying on behalf of the Provenzanos in the upcoming trial. But to the public who didn't know this, Hennessy was an Irish hero gunned down by Italian gangsters. Mayor Joseph A. Shakespeare now went a little bit crazy. And he ordered the wholesale arrest of any and all Italian males between the age of 12 and 55. Within three hours of Hennessy's death in the early morning hours of October 16th, five of the dozens of Italians questioned and arrested were charged with murder. 
Then outside the police station, an angry mob started to gather. These angry Irish Americans spat and jeered at the Italian wives and mothers who had shown up to get their husbands and sons out of jail. When the five Italians were transported to the prison, the Irish crowd followed, chanting in a mocking accent, Who killed the chief? Fucking disgusting. I have no use for anyone who mocks the Italian language. It's a big no no, respect to the spaghetti, a parmesan, a mazzarata, and torna banderas, linguine, cupa, trupa, but Marisa Tome. Forget about it. About a being a capiz, a child bella, pat jack. Anyway, what followed after this unforgivable act of disrespect was an, att- <laughs> was an attempt by a young Irish journalist to shoot one of the men charged with murder. And he did shoot him in the throat, but the man eventually recovered. The journalist was then lauded as a heroic Irish avenger by the community. Uh, in the end, 19 men were indicted for planning and carrying out the execution of Chief Hennessy, all Italian. On February 16th, 1891, nine men went to trial. Despite the public's demand for vengeance, a jury found all nine defendants not guilty. There wasn't enough evidence. Now an angry crowd, and this is terrifying, an angry crowd of Irish residents, over 20,000 of them, gathered in the town square. Together they stormed the parish prison. Armed with guns and clubs and probably some fucking brickbats, they dragged seven Italians in the prison yard, shot them dead execution style. Two more were found hiding in a doghouse, shot and killed on the spot. Another hanged crudely from a lamppost. One final man who pretended to be dead in the yard for a while found hanged from a tree on Orland Street. Uh, It was the largest single mass lynching in American history. And yes, that was 11 people killed while only nine were tried. All 19 Italian men initially arrested were still being held. Eight managed to hide from the angry mob. The court and district attorney set the survivors free after the lynching, dropped the charges against the men who had not yet been tried. Crazily enough, most media, even government figures, considered all of this justified. Mayor Shakespeare declared, I do consider that the act was, however deplorable, a necessity and justifiable. The Italians had taken the law into their own hands, and we had to do the same. Uh, did you? Maybe, maybe not the same Italians. There, you were killing Shakespeare. Kind of an important distinction. Uh, while the incident was not connected to the Irish mob activity in the Northeast, to be clear, it nonetheless established some main themes that would surface in coming conflicts between Irish and Italian underworld figures. Police departments would become considered bastions of the Irish, who ironically worked with Italian gangsters. Uh, the figure of the corrupt Irishman, a cop, a gangster, or both, would be engraved in the culture of the Irish mob now. Public opinion would be divided between Italian and Irish leanings, and racial tensions would explode into violence at the drop of a hat. Now let's move to another city where the Irish would gain a foothold, uh, Chicago, actually. They had a foothold there before the uh, Italians. Most of the early Chicago Irish had touched down in other cities before making their way to a new Midwestern development where opportunity seemed plentiful. The greatest of them all was Michael Cassius McDonald, a.k.a. King Mike McDonald. We met this Michael McDonald before, way back in episode 22. Al Capone's Valentine's Day Massacre, that episode. The origin of me McDonalding you. I forgot about that until I saw his name. Sometimes I forget. I keep forgetting we're not in love anymore. I keep forgetting things will never be the same again. I keep forgetting how you made that so clear. I keep forgetting every time you're near. You get it. Uh, King Mike whose dad was from Ireland, was a gambling overlord, a political mover and shaker, and basically ran Chicago around the turn of the century. He would be another father of the Irish mob, just like John Morrissey. Born in Niagara Falls, New York in 1839, as a boy, he apprenticed to be a bootmaker, but confined to the small slum his parents had immigrated to when they left Ireland. Mike yearned for a bigger world, a world of opportunities and possibilities, not confined to a few shitty city blocks. He first visited Chicago in 1855, settled there in the 1860s, and started his first business venture, a petition calling on all Irishmen to join an Illinois uh, Illinois Irish brigade and fight on behalf of the Union in the Civil War. No, but not really. He had no intention of fighting. Uh, this was a scam. He colluded with army deserters who agreed to turn themselves in, re-enlist, and split the commission that Mike received for recruiting them to join. Then in 1867, he opened his first gambling establishment at 89 Dearborn Street, but his main racket would be bailing anyone out of jail who needed it. The bail bondsman business was highly competitive, but McDonald uh, had an upper hand by employing numerous small-time lawyers to troll the sheriff's office and the criminal courts. And at Mike's behest, they offered to post bond for those charged with crimes on short notice and easy terms. And making all this much, much easier, the judge and the police officers were in Mike's pocket. In the end, everybody got paid. The cops made money on the side while satisfying the reformers and the press that they were making arrests. 
The judge got his cut. The criminal got out of jail. Bail bondsman like Mike McDonald uh, put every criminal in town into his debt as he also amassed a small fortune. By the mid-80s or 1880s, Mike McDonald was a millionaire many times over, but the true measure of his power and influence was only partially based on money. He's credited with having handpicked the city's mayor, Carter Harrison, who presided over Chicago when the population soared from 500,000 to over a million. He was the man behind the man, the criminal behind the corrupt politician, the criminal behind the criminal. Uh, King Mike weathered a series of scandals, including the time when his wife shot and killed a police officer, and then when she ran off with a traveling singer, and he had to go to San Francisco to get her back, and then when she became very devoted to religion but ended up running off with the priests. Man, Mike, for an underworld king, seems like you could have gotten yourself a more uh, devoted wife who caused you less problems. Despite his relationship drama, Mike would still become the king of the boodlers. What the fuck is a boodler? It's a great question. At the time of King Mike's reign, boodling seemed to be the dominant criminal activity in America, at least according to the newspapers of the day. Boodling involved fleecing municipal governments through judicious bribes, the creation of fraudulent shell companies that were the beneficiaries of fraudulent contracts, and the billing of government agencies for services that would never be rendered. You could do this in a number of ways, and Mike did. In 1887, he used his influence to get a renovation contract on the courthouse given to his company, uh, the company uh, insisted on using a special, very expensive paint to the tune of hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and the paint was nothing more than cheap chalk and water. Uh, reminds me of some uh, bullshit government contracts in the 80s when military industrial complex grifters like McDonnell Douglas charged the Navy $2,043 a piece for some basic metal nuts. Custom made, yeah, but nothing special. No expensive material. Not hard to make. Navy also paid $435 for a hammer that looked like the kind you could buy a, at a hardware store for 20 bucks. Uh, or a basic plastic toilet seat uh, cost almost $700. An aluminum ladder <laughs> was once sold for $75,000. An ashtray for $659, a fucking ashtray. And shit like that continues to this day, right? Corporations are the gangsters now, bribing corrupt politicians with campaign contributions or six-figure appearance fee checks in exchange for politicians giving them heavily inflated contracts. A uh, newspaper unraveled King... Uh, Mike's paint scam, but Mike was never charged. And I said hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, excuse me, not hundreds. I was sticking to my head. And he, and he got to keep his money. One of the many scams he pulled off before his party came to an end. On the night of October 28th, 1894, Chicago Mayor Carter Harrison, King Mike's man serving his fifth term now, shot three times at close range by a vengeful city official. The criminal underworld had nothing to do with his death, but without his main mouthpiece, King Mike was deposed. Still, various Irish criminal political machines kept running through the end of the 19th century all over America. In Chicago, New York, Brooklyn, Albany, San Francisco, Kansas City, and especially Boston, where there was a huge Irish population and where one upstart, James Michael Curley, a young ward boss, extorted his followers to vote early and often for Curley. <laughs> I, love, I love just saying vote often. Just like blatant in-your-face voter fraud. Vote early and, and vote many times. Uh, Curley's popularity was such that when he was convicted of fraud for taking a civil service exam on behalf of a constituent, he was reelected by a huge margin from his jail cell. Uh, Curley and other politicians were known to take tribute payments from nearly every kind of illegal business venture. In Chicago, the price was 25 bucks a week for massage parlors and uh, uh, assignation houses, a.k.a. brothels, 50 to to $100 a week for larger brothels. 25 more due of drinks were sold, 50 a month for saloons, 15 a month for selling liquor from an apartment, uh, 25 a week for poker and craps tables. For the last one, poker and craps tables, different gambling overlords controlled different saloons, and these czars were constantly encroaching on one another's turf, which would lead to Chicago's gambling wars. In July of 1907, a bombing war erupted amongst these cities' gambling factions. The first to be hit was Blind John Condon, one of uh, local kingpin Big Jim O'Leary's partners and a link to the Mike McDonald syndicate of the past. On July 23rd, Condon was relaxing in the rear of his home at 2623 Michigan Avenue when a bomb was tossed into his front yard. Luckily, the bomb only caused partial damage to the home's facade. Two days later, July 25th, 9 o'clock at night, German gambling boss Mont Tenz's home was hit with a steel case bomb that landed in a paved alley directly behind his house. Tenz, who was enjoying a bath at the time, was rattled to his feet by an explosion that shattered numerous windows in his house. But the German gambling boss was not hurt. To the police, he claimed he had no idea who might have wanted to do such a thing. Said it must have been the work of some mischievous boys with a cannon cracker. 
I love those terms. Ah, oh, he must have had a cannon cracker, I guess. Ah, oh, these crazy bear cats with the cannon crackers. Uh, the bombs kept flying. Jim, o- Jim O'Leary's Halstead Street Gambling Emporium was hit with the biggest bomb of all. Buildings blocks away shook from the force of the explosion, sending people running down the street. But O'Leary was unharmed and told the police the explosion must have been the result of a cap on a gas pipe blown out or something. Over the next years, there would be dozens of bombings that took place in saloons, pool rooms, gambling parlors, residences, even a South Side police precinct. No one was ever convicted. And incredibly, no one was ever killed. But the bomb shined a spotlight on a lot of illegal gambling and organized crime. With more and more social activists now protesting the immorality of gambling, they were gaining support from a population that had become tired of hearing about the constant bombings. Big Jim O'Leary's uh, retired and sold his operations December 1st, 1911. The gambling wars raged on with 10 strategically bombing Big Jim's many successors until a few years later when an Irish American known as Hinky Dink Kenna, not kidding, Oh, fucking hinky dink. Allegedly stepped in and mediated a peace settlement for the price of $40,000. And what a fucking nickname. Hinky dink must have sounded way cooler back then than it does now. If I was a popular and powerful politician, a friend of the underworld, which Kenna was for decades, I feel like I would push pretty hard for a nickname other than hinky dink. Hinky dink ranks right up there with, uh, you know, twinkle toes in terms of a tough sounding nickname. Despite the truce, the city was still sick of the debauchery and vice. When a police officer was then killed in a shootout, July 13th, 1914, the board of 15, a powerful citizens organization comprised of ministers and temperance leaders, declared war on all commercialized vice in the city. The mob was being driven further underground. By this time, a well-known study on gangs in Chicago by academic Frederick Thrasher estimated there were 1,313 gangs in the city, many of them Irish. These gangs did everything from enforcing tribute payments to mustering up Democratic votes to bullying newspaper vendors into selling more of a certain paper, which one William Randolph Hearst paid a gang uh, called the Reagan's Colts to do for his paper, the Chicago American. But while Chicago had once been a wide open town where these things were somewhat tolerated, that would be no longer. Prohibition was coming. By 1918, the temperance movement that would become an all-out prohibition was well on its way to success. The war in Europe had aided their cause. Grain savings, limits on alcohol production were imposed, and there was a heightened concern for the moral well-being of young men in uniform. The temperance leaders and hellfire preachers crusading against liquor organized into a well-funded lobby. Nine states had already gone dry by the time the U.S. Senate passed legislation banning the use and sale of alcoholic spirits nationwide. In January of 1919, the 18th Amendment was passed, which prohibited the manufacture, sale, or consumption of alcoholic beverages on January 19th. A year later, uh, the laws that would regulate enforcement of the amendment came into effect. These laws would become known as the Volstead Act, named after Andrew Volstead, the Minnesota congressman who first introduced the prohibition legislation in the House of Representatives. The Volstead Act laid out the nitty-gritty details of prohibition, also spelled out the exceptions requiring a government permit, which included sacramental wine, uh, you know, medications containing alcohol, uh, hard liquor prescribed by a physician, flavoring extracts, syrups, and more. The penalties for violations of the act range from a $500 fine for a first offense to a $2,000 fine and five years in prison for repeat offenders. And this act, of course, would also bring about a very unintended result. The vice that the temperance movement, supporters, and moralists have been trying to drive further underground with this act would fucking explode. Because when it comes to drugs, including alcohol, no one will fucking ever, ever, ever put that genie back in the bottle. Make it illegal, and you just give organized criminals a massive income stream. That shit is here to stay forever. You can legalize, you can tax it, you can regulate it to make it as safe as possible, or in my opinion, you can delude yourself into thinking a true war on drugs victory is ever possible. Uh, Big Tim Sullivan Morrissey's New York Irish mob successor, who we mentioned previously a bit ago, had died in 1913 under mysterious circumstances after being diagnosed with syphilis, so maybe not totally mysterious. Uh, But first, he created a system that made making a shitload of money selling illegal booze possible. It'd be based on two things, muscle and patronage. You use muscle to get yourself into a position of power, then use patronage to take care of those who got you into that position. Unlike the days of John Morrissey, Big Tim and those who came after him would move the Irish mob away from the political machine and towards the everyday man, the saloon keepers, businessmen, shopkeepers, and fellow mobsters. These were the people who would all work together to devise a system for making a top quality product, storing it, and delivering it to the customer, and making so much fucking money. And one of the people who would step up to the plate to organize this system was Owen Victor Madden, another underworld Irish legend. Oney, 
Oni Madden, a.k.a. the Duke of the West Side, was a street punk and a killer. His nickname was literally just The Killer, who transformed himself into an underworld star. Born on Christmas Day in 1891 in Liverpool, England, to poor Irish parents, he was sent to live with an aunt in New York City when his dad died in 1903. The aunt or aunt lived in a shitty tenement in the midtown Manhattan neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen. Located on the west side along the docks of the Hudson River between 14th and 57th Streets, uh, the neighborhood's boundaries will change somewhat in later years, Hell's Kitchen had supplanted the old Five Points District as the spot to be for young Irish gangsters. It was an immigrant neighborhood full of Irish, Germans, and Italians, beset by constant noisy traffic and an elevated railway on one side and the Hudson River Railroad on the other. In 1910, a report by a group of social workers described it as full of monotonous ugliness, much dirt, and a great deal of despair. Yeah, it sounds absolutely fucking horrible. Uh, kids spent their time hawking newspapers, fighting, picking pockets, swimming in the Hudson River, or flying pigeons from tenement rooftops. When Owen arrived, the area was in control of the Gopher Gang, also known as the, the Goofer Gang. Not the best gang name. Sounds about as tough as a Bad News Bears or Little Rascals or something. But they actually were very tough. They would brick bat the shit out of you. And they often clashed with the Hudson Dusters of Greenwich Village, uh, also with themselves. The gang's leaders never lasted for more than a few months, fellow members constantly taking them out. Many of its members were notorious in the press for violence, like Happy Jack Mulraney, who murdered someone else known as Patty the Priest for laughing at his facial disfigurement. So maybe Jack was not all that happy. There was also Mallet Murphy, <laughs> who routinely bludgeoned unruly customers in his saloon with a wooden mallet. God, bludgeoning people. That's a rough night when you go out for a few drinks, end up tying one on, and then wake up sometime the next day with the worst headache of your life, not from the alcohol, but from being literally bludgeoned. There was one lung Curran, <laughs> these fucking names kill me, who started a fashion craze in Hell's Kitchen when he blackjacked a policeman, stole his overcoat, then gave it to his girlfriend to wear as a trophy. Uh, the goofers were also known for frequently raiding and robbing the West Side Railroad Yards. It would be here that Oni the Killer Madden established a reputation as a fearless hoodlum, leading a pack of goofers on railroad raids in which they made off with whatever they could. Clothes, food, booze, sometimes guns and ammo. Madden was good with weapons, particularly a lead pipe wrapped in newspaper. Okay, why was it wrapped in newspaper? I'm guessing so people would think that all you had was a, oh, look at that, just a rolled up newspaper. Aha, come on. I don't even have to defend myself. And then the fucking lead pipe cracks your skull or busts your ribs or breaks your arm or whatever, and then it's all over. Think about how psychotic, violent, tough, and fearless you would have to be to make a name for yourself as a tough guy in this underworld. Madden rose to become the leader of the Goofers and was arrested, according to historical records, over the course of his life, 57 times. <laughs> they clearly did not have the three strikes and you're out kind of programs to keep people locked up back then. Uh, on one early occasion when he was arrested, Oni bragged to a police reporter that he'd never worked an honest day in his life and never intended to. When the reporter asked him to jot down a record of his daily routine, the then teenage gang boss obliged and he wrote, Thursday, went to a dance in the afternoon, went to a dance at night and then to a cabaret, took some girls home, went to a restaurant, stayed there until Friday morning. Friday, spent the day with Frida Horner, which is his like official girlfriend, uh, looked at some fancy pigeons. <laughs> Met some friends in a saloon early in the evening and stayed with them until five o'clock in the morning. I love fucking fancy pigeons, that detail, right? This guy's partying until five in the morning, taking random girls home, hanging out with his main girl. And, you know, sometimes taking some time to check out some fancy pigeons. Saturday, slept all day. Went to a dance in the Bronx late in the afternoon and to a dance on Park and Avenue, Avenue at night. Sunday, slept until three o'clock. Went to a dance in the afternoon and another in the same place at night. After that, I went to a cabaret, stayed there until almost, I uh, stayed there almost all night. Uh, by the age of 18, he would earn his nickname, The Killer, from the cops. He was said to have killed his first man in a local Italian merchant when he was just 14. Neighborhood witnesses adhered to a code of silence, refused to testify against him. By the time he was in his 20s, Oni Madden was feared and admired by those who knew uh, what was what, but still virtually unknown to the public at large. That was because by now the American underworld was increasingly believed to be the exclusive domain of the Italian mafia, allowing the Irish Madden to slide around undetected. When booze was made illegal, he became less of a thug, more of an entrepreneur, opened a massive brewery in the middle of New York City. In early 1924, the Phoenix Cereal Beverage Company opened for business at 26th Street and 10th Avenue. Using a government patent that had been secured by the brewery's previous owners, the Phoenix operated under the guise of government authorization while producing an illegal product called Madden's No. 1. In addition to taking on this enterprise, Madden also used his connections to establish a number of popular nightclubs that would become the customers for Madden's number one, 
which was a beer, as well as his bootleg rum, scotch, vodka, and even champagne. And if you want to know what Madsen number one tastes like, the Superior Bathhouse Brewery in Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, makes it today using the original recipe. Hot Springs has a huge historical association with organized crime. Oni will help run that town towards the end of his life. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, At this point in his life, Oni's New York nightclubs and speakeasies would become super popular hotspots during the Roaring Twenties. And to keep them operating under Oni's control, that required protection. Cold, hard cash would be stuffed into envelopes, passed from hand to hand, It'd end up in all kinds of places, a special police widow's fund, pockets of ward bosses, district leaders, judges, precinct captains, lieutenants, shift commanders, tons of patrolmen. With so much law enforcement and political figures in Oni's pocket, the booze flowed freely. And it wasn't just Madden running New York's booze racket. Various other Irishmen were big figures in the city's underworld. There was uh, Vanny Higgins, the leading Irish mob boss of Brooklyn, who had speedboats, even airplanes, running room and bu- uh, rum and booze. Jack Legs Diamond from Philadelphia uh, was a legendary Irish gunman and booze slinger, as well as an uh, Irish-born orphan and teenager named Vincent Cole. And the Irish were all over the city's political machine. Of the city's 36 wards, more than half were run by bosses of Irish descent, uh, with numerous other district leaders, precinct captains, election officials, tracing their roots back to the Emerald Isle. But these Irish also knew they couldn't do it all alone. So now they incorporated WASP, Jewish, Polish, Italian representatives, giving everyone a piece of the pie. When Big Bill Dwyer was finally arrested and convicted on bootlegging charges in 1925 or 1920 and 1926, uh, excuse me, it was an Italian, Francisco Castiglia, who stepped in and took on the daily runnings of the operation. He'd run it until Big Bill, uh, Big Bill was released early for good behavior after serving 13 months. Infamous gangster Lucky Luciano, also part of the system. A lot of Italians and Irish working together. Uh, indeed, prohibition, prohibition uh, brought about a type of ethnic uh, intermingling that had been unseen in the decades before. As long as you knew the password and could pay up, you could visit any one of the roughly 32,000 speakeasies in the state of New York alone, whatever your creed, race, or ethnicity. Roughly 32,000. Prohibition, what a fucking joke. All it did was keep beer and whiskey out of the hands of the most law-abiding citizens. This is what many fear uh, with gun control legislation, right? While it would actually reduce the overall number of guns in the hands of the citizenry, uh, citizenry, my mouth's all over the place today. Who would it take them away from? The most law-abiding citizens is the fear. And it would very likely also open up a massive black market for everyone else. And so many things like this uh, prohibition, they sound good on paper to some, but in reality looks so different. Uh, meanwhile, the fast-talking devil-may-care Irish gangsters became something like fashion icons, the way hip-hop artists would be in the, in the 90s, with many seeking to emulate their street style. New York City's love affair with the Irish gangsters may have reached its pinnacle in 1926 when Jimmy Walker... A smart-talking former Tin Pan Alley songwriter was elected mayor. Walker was not a bootlegger, but he was an Irish Catholic politician who liked to drink and hang out in Broadway nightclubs where he shook hands and had shots with people like Oni the Killer Madden. Walker spoke publicly of his desire to see prohibition repealed and appointed a police commissioner who wouldn't be too hard on the mobsters. While the commissioner was not hard on the bootleggers, the Irish mob was, if he didn't play by their rules. Independent operators were forbidden. And going against that could easily cause you to be found, you know, dead in a ditch with a smashed in skull or a bunch of bullet holes. Anyone who participated in bootlegging had to answer to the system and the guys at the top of it. Your distance from New York City did not matter. The Irish mob extended from southern New Jersey to the Canadian border, monitoring all operations in between. But there was, of course, guys who risked execution to break out on their own, and some had success, right? Others from within the Irish criminal ranks, or excuse me, often from within the Irish criminal ranks. A former member of the organization we mentioned named Jack Legs Diamond took on the system, blazed his own trail for a while. The tabloids called him the most picturesque racketeer in the underworld, most publicized of public enemies, and most shot-at man in America. Born in Philadelphia, his parents had come from Ireland. He was first arrested at age 17 when he got caught breaking into a jewelry store in Brooklyn. After his release, he'd be arrested six more times before being drafted into the U.S. Army. He'd then soon be charged with desertion, along with several other crimes, and served a prison sentence before Warren G. Harding pardoned him, along with more than two dozen other federal prison uh, prisoners. Uh, Diamond immediately headed back to New York and became part of the thriving Prohibition underworld. Made money stealing, selling minks, jewelry, running card games. Then his head got bigger, he started picking off booze shipments from other Irish gangsters at gunpoint. Hijacking trucks that belonged to Big Bill Dwyer and Oni the Killer Madden. Soon after that, Diamond nearly got gunned down in a drive-by shooting when a shotgun opened fire on his car on 110th Street. Diamond floored it, 
drove to Mount Sinai Hospital where he was quickly treated and went on to make a full recovery. He would then move his operation to Greene County in upstate New York where he escaped most of the system's fury, but things eventually caught up to him. After numerous assassination attempts, he would finally be shot three times in the head at close range while he lay in bed in Albany in a boarding house on December 18, 1931. And he would make a full recovery, but he would decide to retire. Now, JK, no, he would uh, he would not make a full recovery. He was very dead. I don't think anyone makes a full recovery after being shot three times in the head at close range. Uh, there was wider conflict as well. Uh, though the New York system saw unparalleled cooperation between Italians and Irish, elsewhere, ethnic mob wars raged like in Cleveland, St. Louis, Kansas City, Boston, Philly, Baltimore, especially Chicago. Throughout the middle years of the Roaring Twenties, gangland Chicago would come to define the uh, violent nature of prohibition. In 1924, the balance of gangland power would shift from the Irish to the Italians in Chicago. One day in early May of that year, Dean O'Banion, legendary Chicago Irish bootlegger, approached Papa John Torrio. Better bootleggers, better mobsters, Papa Torrio. Uh, Torrio was a major player in the Italian underworld, and he was approached with an astounding proposition. O'Banion was looking to get out of the bootlegging business, he said, and wondered if Torrio wanted to buy out his interest in the Seabin Brewery, an extremely profitable beer manufacturing operation jointly owned by him, Torrio, and a few others. The brewery had been producing quality beer in O'Banion's Northside Territory for three years under the protection of paid-off precinct police. For half a million dollars, said O'Banion, he would divest his share, explain that he wanted out because the bootlegging business had become too dangerous for his taste. Torrio would be doing him a favor by buying him out. As a parting gesture, uh, gesture of goodwill, he even assisted, uh, or he'd even assist in the turning over of the last shipment. Torrio jumped at the offer, even though his second in command, a man named Al Scarface Capone, cautioned that he smelled a rat. O'Banion and Torrio, along with two members of Dini's crew, and under the watchful eye of two uniformed police officers who were on the payroll, met at the Seban Brewery the morning of May 19th. And there, Torrio delivered his payment of $500,000 in cash, which translates to almost $9 million in today's dollars. In return, O'Banion escorted Torrio around the facility, showing him the recently concocted shipment of beer ready for delivery to speakeasies throughout the city, showed him the financial ledgers, listing the various bootlegging organizations that were scheduled to receive product. After Torrio had fully assessed the operation and the last of 13 trucks was loaded by a crew of Teamsters, he asked O'Banion, so what will you do with yourself now that you're out? And Dini smiled and said, I'm retiring to Colorado to become a gentleman farmer. And now before Torrio had even finished chuckling at that remark, from all directions, blocking all exits, came a troop of blue uniforms led by none other than the chief of police, Morgan Collins. You're all under arrest for violation of the Volstead Act, announced Collins. He personally ripped the badges from the two corrupt uniformed officers on the premises. 130,000 gallons of beer were confiscated and 31 bootleggers were arrested. What Torrio didn't know was at Seban Brewery, the bust had been a setup. Uh, the Irishman had known about the police raid from the beginning and made sure that Torrio was on the premises to be arrested. He had cut a deal. In the months before, a pair of Sicilian brothers named the Jennas had been muscling in on Irish territory, flooding O'Banion's district with cheap whiskey and fucking up his business. And this was O'Banion's payback for that. And now Torrio was furious. And then tension between the Irish and the Italians escalated. On November 3rd, 1924, weekly split the profits at the uh, weekly split the profits meeting at the ship, a gambling emporium in the Chicago suburb of Cicero that was jointly controlled by Torrio, O'Banion, and others. Torrio was not there that night. He was uh, in Italy with his family. Presiding over the meeting instead was Scarface Capone, who was there with five or six other Italians. As Capone handed O'Banion his weekly cut, he noted that Angelo Jenna of the Jenna brothers had lost heavily at the roulette table that week and left an IOU for 30000 Capone suggested to the group that in the interest of General Amity, they cancel Jenna's debt. And O'Banion refused, saying that Angelo Jenna had one week to pay. When someone protested, he said that Jenna could go to hell. Scarface didn't say anything but clearly made a mental decision to send O'Banion to hell before Jenna was going to get there. Exactly a week later, on the morning of November 10th, O'Banion was in the back of his flower shop, working on his flowers. Three men entered the front door. A few moments later, the store porter heard gunshots, dashed into the front room to find Dini O'Banion on the floor, surrounded by broken vases, blood pouring out of him from a couple different holes. By the time police arrived, he was dead. It was a classic Italian mob hit. The funeral would draw thousands, including Capone, Johnny Torrio, and how insulting to the O'Banion family, the fucking Jenna brothers. Now a true gang war would begin and it would be a battle to the death. Unlike Torrio, Capone had no interest in negotiation or appeasement with anyone. His bluntly stated goal was to take over not only the entire city, but then the county, and then, after the state, the entire Midwest. There would be no partners, only subsidiaries. 
his war would be bloody. During a three-year period from 1924 to 1927, there were, according to the Chicago Crime Commission, 150 prohibition-related killings just in Chicago. Let's look at one of them. On April 27th, 1926, William H. McSwiggin, smart, highly touted 26-year-old Irish uh, prosecutor in the state attorney's office and a friend of some Irish gangsters, was shot dead. The son of a decorated Chicago cop, in one year alone, he had won convictions in nine straight capital cases. At 6 o'clock in the evening of the 27th, McSwiggin was eating supper at 4946 West Washington Boulevard, where he still lived with his parents and four sisters. He was visited by Tom Red Duffy, a boyhood chum, known member of the West Side O'Donnell gang. McSwiggin left his meal unfinished, saying he was going to play cards with some friends. The group uh, bar hopped for a while. Their last stop was the Pony Inn, a two-story white brick saloon owned by Harry Madigan, once a member of Reagan's Colts gang. And, and uh, at a 5613 West Roosevelt Road, the Pony Inn was a mile north of the Hawthorne Inn, which was Al Capone's new headquarters in Cicero. A Capone scout spotted Klondike O'Donnell's Lincoln, Klondike, another Irish gangster, parked in front of the Pony Inn, notified his boss immediately. Capone grabbed a Tommy gun, quickly assembled a team of men. They deployed five cars with a total of four gunmen. The vehicles lined up half a block away from the Pony Inn, waited for the Irishmen to appear. Shortly after eight, McSwiggin popped out. Then the machine gun fire began. McSwiggin was shot multiple times through the neck, died as his friends tried to move his body. When his body was later found, it was a big scandal. The county's crusading prosecutor killed in the company of known gangsters. The ineffectual investigation led to a grim conclusion. Justice was no match for the underworld. Evidence seized disappeared mysteriously. Witnesses conveniently forgot what happened. And police officers tipped off saloon owners that there would be an investigation, giving them plenty of time to appear squeaky clean. Around this time, and partially because of the McSwiggin murder, the violence and general air of lawlessness brought about by prohibition gradually turned nearly everyone against the Volstead Act. Politicians and law enforcement now began to routinely condemn the act, acknowledging that it was patently unenforceable. Soon, prohibition would be over in 1933. And with it, organized crime for both the Irish, who were waning in power by the late 1920s, and the Italians lost a lot of money and therefore a lot of power and influence. Besides the end of Prohibition, the beginning of the Depression, and also several high-profile murders, the Irish mob were weakening now for another reason, the advent of Lucky Charms cereal. This was huge. When Lucky Charms showed up in the fall of 1932 in America, debuting alongside a massive marketing campaign, accompanied by a pervasive radio jingle, Frosted Lucky Charms, the magically delicious. So many newspaper ads featuring drawings of happy little leprechauns. It really led the American public in general to stop taking Irish people seriously. No one was scared of them anymore. Even when they killed people, reporters would write stuff like, looks like someone must have tried to take grouchy little Patty Kilkenny's pot of gold. Silly rascal gunned down a couple outside of the Crescent Theater before likely skipping away in search of another rainbow. Cops feel confident they'll find and arrest him soon. They're on the lookout for trails of multicolored marshmallows and gingers dressed in green who speak in limericks. <laughs> and of course, that is all nonsense. Uh, here's why the Irish power really was waning. I wish that last part was true. Uh, there was a changing of the guard. Thanks to immensely powerful bosses like Al Capone and Lucky Luciano, the Irish were out. Italians and their Polish, Jewish, and black allies, they were in. Irish American bootleggers looking to make a buck increasingly ran up against a brick wall. Some never even made it to the starting gate. Over the three-year period from 1931 to 1933, right up until after, uh, right up, excuse me, until prohibition ended, virtually every high-ranking Irish American bootlegger in the Northeastern United States were systematically executed. Jack Legs Diamond, Vincent Cole, Danny Wallace, leader of the Irish Gustin Gang, Barney Walsh, mob boss of Brooklyn, Vanny Higgins, Danny Walsh of Rhode Island. Oh, I'm sorry. Barney Walsh was the mob boss of Brooklyn and then Vanny Higgins and then Danny Walsh Rhode Island all executed. In the middle of this, Oni Madden was arrested on a minor parole violation. Could have gotten off, but chose not to. Smart guy, hid for a year in prison, then negotiated a formal exit out of New York's vice racket with Luciano and Costello. And he quote unquote retired to Hot Springs, Arkansas, not really uh, retiring at all. Uh, there he presided over a collection of casinos, hotels, and brothels, working as a kind of on-site supervisor for the Italian mobsters back in New York who owned all of this. Hot Springs became a resort town for mobsters on the run with Oni managing it all for the true power players above him. Okay, now let's shift gears just for a second uh, to pop culture, a big pop culture moment for the Irish gangsters. In May of 1931, a movie called The Public Enemy opened in theaters across the country and exposed all of America to the Irish mob way of life. Produced by Warner Brothers Studios, directed by William Wellman, 
The film starred a 31-year-old James Cagney, who had played a secondary role, excuse me, in four previous Hollywood pictures, but was relatively unknown beyond the New York stage. Cagney was three-quarters Irish, son of an Irish bartender and amateur boxer, and an Irish and Norwegian mother. In the movie, Cagney played Tom Powers, an Irish-American hoodlum who rises from the fetid stockyard district in Chicago as a kid to become a successful bootlegger. From the day it opened, the movie was a sensation. It incorporated many details from the life of Dean O'Banion. Cagney himself picked up uh, many of his mannerisms from some Irish underworld figures he had grown up around in Manhattan. He'd actually been introduced to Killer Madden sometime in the late 1920s at the infamous Stork Club. The Irish mob, what was left of them, they loved Cagney's portrayal. Although the film didn't go lightly on Tom Powers' sociopathic nature, Cagney gave the character a kind of hard scrabble humanity. All right, now back to the real gangsters. Prohibition, as I said earlier, came to an end April 7th, 1933, when newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt asked Congress to modify the Volstead Act to permit the manufacture of beer with an alcohol content of uh, more than 3.2%. Congress did so immediately. Beer trucks once again rumbled through the streets, free of gangster escorts, thousands of speakeasies, flung their doors wide, and became legal beer saloons once again. Later in the year, the 21st Amendment would pass, repealing all Prohibition-era laws and statutes. And while mobsters lost a big revenue stream, they, of course, would now fade away quietly with the end of Prohibition. But the rampant gangland murders in Chicago and New York did die down. Mobsters quickly shifted to other rackets, narcotics, racketeering, fixing boxing matches, and so on. But then another underworld blow would soon be struck. There would be coming a a big national crackdown on political corruption, bringing the end of an era for the Irish mob who had been part of the political machine for nearly 80 years now. Franklin Roosevelt, as the governor of New York, had been the first to establish a panel to investigate corruption in the magistrate's court. Some years back, to oversee the investigation, Roosevelt approved the appointment of recently retired judge, an upright, no-nonsense guy, no friend of Tammany Hall, Samuel Seabury. Seabury insisted on still being referred to as judge, even though he left the Court of Appeals in 1916. With his waspy demeanor, white hair, and spectacles, he epitomized a new image in the catalog of moral crusaders that had always been opposed to the Irish mob. But Roosevelt may not have done this for completely pure reasons. It was common knowledge by then that he was going to run for president. And his biggest opponent was Tammany Hall choice, a Catholic named Al Smith. If Tammany Hall was exposed, Smith would be forced out of the race. Seabury's first target would be the NYPD. Well known, the cops have been engaging in corruption for decades, right? Working alongside career criminals on the payroll. One common scam a lot of cops were involved in was called the doctor's racket, wearing a criminal posing as a patient entered an office while the doctor was out and demanded immediate treatment for some fictitious ailment. Over the nurse's protest, he placed money in a conspicuous place in the office, began to undress. Just as he dropped his pants, cops would burst in and arrest the nurse for prostitution. This would be followed by the suggestion that a cash payment could make the phony case go away. These guys just pulling their own scams outside of the uh, mob. Uh, There was another scam called the landlady racket where innocent landladies would be falsely arrested for running a house of prostitution. When all else failed, the vice squad would simply swoop down on Harlem, break into people's apartments, make random arrests of women again for bullshit prostitution charges. What a bunch of fucking assholes. Consistently picking on women and maligning their reputations to make an easy buck. Lucifina very displeased. The magistrates, who in many cases were in on the scam, chose to believe the cops rather than the innocent women charged as prostitutes. If a woman refused or was unable to make a payoff, she could languish in jail for up to 100 days. Sometimes these arrests were made to meet precinct quotas as well. And then there were the cops who were being paid off by speakeasies and saloons. All this made a lot of cops a lot of money. And soon Seabury began an investigation into how so many cops had bank accounts flush with cash on salaries ranging from just three to $10,000 a year. Even the city's mayor, Jimmy Walker, was called to appear before the Seabury Commission. The mayor was feisty on the stand and at one point said under his breath to the politically ambitious Seabury, You and Frank Roosevelt are going to hoist yourself to the presidency over my dead body. But the scandalous trial would prove to be too much and Mayor Walker would resign. And soon soon, loads of gangsters, not only the Irish, would find themselves in the prosecution's crosshairs. Most famously, Scarface, Al Capone, nailed on tax evasion charges and sentenced to prison in 1933. Waxy Gordon, the beer baron in New Jersey, got himself prosecuted on tax charges. During his trial, it was shown that in 1930, his income from beer sales alone was almost $1.4 million. In 1931, he brought home over a million as well. Lucky Luciano would be prosecuted and convicted of running a prostitution racket by Thomas E. Dewey, a professional mob buster who had been a U.S. attorney, special prosecutor, and district attorney. At the end of the decade, in April of 1939, another Irish scion would fall when after months of investigation, the IRS went public with their findings. 
in a period from 1927 to 1937, Kansas City Irish boss Thomas T.J. Pentegrast failed to report his income the staggering figure of $1,240,000, defrauding the government of over half a million dollars in taxes. Tracing all the money that Pentegrast had received proved difficult, said the investigator, since he kept negligible records, rarely used a bank account, almost always accepted only cash payments, made virtually all expenditures in cash, and sent large amounts by wire under assumed names. Pentagrass' parents were from County Tipperary and had arrived to the U.S. through New Orleans. He'd become a leader in the Kansas City political machine after the death of his brother, Jim Pentagrass. A month after the indictment, to the surprise of many, Boss Tom, as TJ was known, entered into plea negotiations with the prosecution. Suffering from a chronic heart condition, he did not look forward to a contentious, embarrassing trial that he felt he could not win. Consequently, Pentagrass pled guilty in exchange for a sentence of 15 months in federal prison. In addition, the judge announced the defendant will not be permitted to bet on the races or gamble in any form. He will not be permitted directly or indirectly to take part in any sort of political activity unless his full civil rights shall be restored by a presidential pardon. Tom Pentagrass served his time in prison and then lived out his remaining years in ill health and out of the underworld game. All over America, Irish political machines were dying now. The New Deal designed by Franklin Roosevelt to counteract the Great Depression and boost industry made a federal system out of the services that had once been provided by political organizations like Tammany Hall. Now, instead of regional political machines providing food and protection to the poor, well, the government was doing that. Federal work projects, food stamps, low-income housing, once the domain in some form of the Irish mob were no longer. Culturally, too, the Great Potato Famine was almost 100 years away, and the Irish no longer needed to scramble for a position in American society. They'd had a controlling interest in many American institutions, police forces, fire departments, public works. They'd sent their kids to school to become proper businessmen, doctors, lawyers, etc., and the need for the Irish political machine, just not what it once was. The Irish mob now had less organizing structure than ever. Then on June 22, 1944, President Roosevelt signed into law a piece of legislation that inadvertently probably had more to do with the death of the Irish-American gang culture than any other single factor. It was called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, otherwise known as the GI Bill. Right Since the days of the Civil War, military service had been an alternative to gang life. For many young Irish-American males raised in a culture where violence, early alcoholism, and machismo were the norm, the GI Bill offered a clear path out of the ghetto that did not involve the constant risk of imprisonment. Irish Americans took advantage of the new opportunity in droves, leaving behind a life of low-level criminality for a college degree, a house in the suburbs, and a family. But not all of them, of course. The remaining Irish mobsters would go full fucking Bear Gryllis, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Now untethered from a structure that prioritized wards, other institutions would rise up and become the center for the Irish mob's activity, like the International Longshoremen's Association. By the mid-1940s, the International Longshoremen's Association and the Port of New York boasted a membership of 40,000 workers. Most were part-time. Many were beholden to a particular hiring boss or waterfront gang, all of which guaranteed a desperate and compliant workforce. The ILA may have advocated for workers during labor disputes, but also ruthlessly enforced the shape-up system, which was the foundation for the entire constellation of waterfront rackets. And the man who ran it for 26 years was a tough individual known to his workforce as Boss Joe, a.k.a. Joseph P. Ryan. Thanks to Boss Joe, many former bootleggers found new life as dock wallopers and union enforcers. These Irish controlled the docks in Jersey City and on Manhattan's west side. Since many of the Irish had initially come to the U.S. and found workers, ditch diggers, bridge builders, railroad workers, they long had a deep presence in union organizing to protect against exploitation and unsafe working conditions in these labor jobs. For almost three decades, Joe and his union cronies all got fat together, with Boss Joe somehow netting millions despite on paper receiving a modest annual salary of about 20000 plus an extra seven for expenses. At the same time, he became perhaps the most powerful labor leader in the country, a benefactor to mayors, senators, presidents, and assorted killers and hoodlums. But that didn't mean things always went smoothly at the docks. Sometimes Boss Joe had to take out the competition. Early in the morning of January 8, 1947, dock worker Andy Hintz left his apartment on Grove Street in Greenwich Village, just a stone's throw from Pier 51, where he worked as a waterfront hiring boss for the last seven months. Hintz never made it to work that day. In front of his building, three men appeared. One of them said, hey, Andy. And then they all opened fire and pumped him full of six bullets. Hintz was a tough bastard. He lingered for three weeks in the hospital, drifting in and out of consciousness. Before he died on January 29th, he told his wife, Johnny Dunn shot me. And who was Johnny Dunn? He was one of Boss Joe's workers slash henchmen. 
a man tasked with illegally importing drugs. He'd also been the person that shortly before Hintz's death, Hintz had told to go to hell. Second guy in today's suck to get shot up for saying that. After the murder, John Dunn, his sidekick, Squint Sheridan, fucking Squint, why not? And a third man, former prize fighter, Danny Gentile, were immediately arrested for the murder of Andy Hintz. The shooting and arrest were major stories in the local newspapers, especially since it, uh, it involved a couple of notorious gunmen for the ILA. John Dunn was found guilty as charged after the two other longshoresmen flipped and turned state's witness, and then Dunn was sentenced to death. Before long, Dunn now was ready to flip, just like his former friends. Dunn suggested that if his life sentence, or excuse me, if his death sentence were commuted to life imprisonment, he could supply information that would solve over 30 murders along the waterfront. Beyond that, he could name the higher-ups in the field of politics who had protected all the rackets along the docks for years, including the very top boss of all. But then the prosecutor's office mysteriously was unwilling to make a deal. Weird, it's almost like they were paid not to look further into things and or intimidated. So Boss Joe continued to live up the uh, high life until his own greed and arrogance finally led the rank and file to rise up against him. Eventually, the public turned against him. Uh, On May 5th, 1953, not long before being compelled to testify, before a public tribunal known as the New York State Waterfront Commission, Boss Joe was convicted of stealing union funds, $500,000 worth, and carted off to prison. Now let's move into the 1950s, when there was a lot of Irish-on-Irish gang movement. In December of 1954, a young attorney you've probably heard of, Robert F. Bobby Kennedy, had been appointed as Senator McCarthy's assistant counsel. Kennedy was the seventh of nine children born to Joseph P. Kennedy, well-known billionaire banker, entrepreneur, former U.S. ambassador during the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration. These Irish were nothing like the people we've covered so far in our story. Joe Kennedy had been born into a political family in East Boston. The grandson of Irish immigrants, he made a massive fortune as a stock market uh, and commodity investor, later invested his profits in real estate and a wide range of business industries industries across the U.S. Uh, the younger Kennedys were members of the upper 1% the moment they were born. And one of those Kennedys, Bobby, was now about to go up against some Irish uh, mobsters. In late 1956, when Kennedy was approached by Senator John L. J. McClellan of Arkansas to take part in yet another major Senate investigation, this one looked into the role of mobsters and labor racketeers in the Teamsters Union, the young lawyer jumped the chance. Officially, the investigation was to be called the Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in the Labor or Management Field. The committee and their investigators would be given the power of subpoena, uh, you know, to subpoena whoever they wanted. For Kennedy, 32 years old, looking to put his career on par with uh, that of his older brother, John, who is now a senator, the offer seemed irresistible. Joe Kennedy, his dad, was fucking livid. He said he did not want Bobby's investigation to turn the Irish Catholic vote against John Kennedy, who was already gearing up for a later presidential run, but Bobby held his ground. What Bobby did not know was that his dad had other reasons not to want him to investigate Irish underworld figures. He'd been quietly dealing with the Irish mob for years. And by dealing with, I mean working with. Uh, To be clear, the following information is not agreed upon by historical scholars. Some think it's nothing more than hearsay and rumor. Many others think that the only reason there are not a lot of firm historical records about this is because Joe worked hard to hide the evidence. At the very least, uh, there is a lot of smoke if there's not any actual fire when it comes to the real origins of the Kennedy family fortune. Back in the days of Prohibition, the elder Kennedy for sure had been a rum runner and whiskey baron, an importer and wholesaler. He did purchase large quantities of alcohol, mostly scotch from England or Canada. The only thing up for debate is what happened to it from there. But really, why the fuck would you buy all this if you weren't importing it illegally into the U.S.? The booze was reportedly usually transferred from Nova Scotia to the eastern seaboard, where it was offloaded along the Massachusetts or Rhode Island coastline or somewhere in Long Island. The bootleggers and crime syndicates would take it from there. And the profits for Kennedy allegedly were staggering. The best scotch cost 45 bucks a case. The cost of shipping along Rum Row would add another 10 bucks a case. Labor and payoffs maybe another 10 bucks for an adjusted total of $65 a case or $325,000 for a typical 5,000 case shipment. It was then rebottled, sold to bootleggers for $85 a case. Thus the net profit for Kennedy on a $325,000 investment could be a hundred grand tax free. And if you're doing this on a shipment or on shipment after shipment, right? That money uh, rockets up quick. And now Joe's son, Bobby is on the Irish mobs case, Right chasing the people who may have made his family's fortune. Not good. The McClellan Committee turned out to be one of the longest, most expensive senatorial investigations in U.S. history. Lasting over two years with over 1,500 witnesses, Bobby especially focused on Teamsters Vice President Jimmy Hoffa. We will not go into him deeply today. He deserves to be an episode of his own. 
As Bobby kept crusading against organized crime, Joe supposedly was taking a lot of these same figures and asking them to endorse JFK for president. Joe would even recruit Frank Sinatra to break the ice with some high up mob figures he didn't know personally yet, especially in states where he thought JFK would have trouble, like Virginia and Illinois. By far, the majority of these figures were Italian Americans since the Irish mob had mostly been forced out after prohibition, forced to seek refuge in police departments and ward politics. JFK would win in West Virginia, went on to secure the nomination by August 1960. On election day, November 8th, everything fell into place. November 8th, 1960, excuse me. Uh, JFK won by a slim margin, but he did win. Bobby Kennedy would become his attorney general at the behest of Papa Joe, and Bobby, Bobby Kennedy's subsequent actions were swift and unprecedented. The number of attorneys in the department's organized crime and racketeering section ballooned from 17 to 63. The number of illegal bugs and wire traps uh, grew from a few to more than 800 nationwide. Bobby drew up a list of top mob targets, a list that included Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancarna, or Giancana, excuse me, supposedly some of the very men who Papa Joe had leaned on to get JFK elected. He had federal agents snatch New Orleans crime boss Carlos Marcello off the streets and deport him. He obtained disclosures by Joseph M. Valachi, a federal prison inmate who described the mob's organizational structure and initiation rights. Now in televised hearings, Valachi introduced the terms Don and Capo to the American public and more. Bobby Kennedy's actions were a knife in the fucking back to the mobsters that Papa Joe solicited. It especially angered the mafia because Bobby seemed to be pretending that his family's lily white Irish hands had never been tainted by any dirty money when everyone in the underworld seemed to know that was not true. Which brings us to November 22nd, 1963, the day JFK was shot in Dallas during a presidential motorcade. Many would and still think the mob had something to do with it. We covered the assassination of JFK way back when with a two-parter. Check it out for more detailed analysis of uh, who might have been behind it. I still think the mob and the CIA had something to do with it. Whether the mob was behind it or not, JFK and Bobby Kennedy had, perhaps unwittingly, inherited a violent underworld legacy that could be traced back to the earliest grapples for power in neighborhoods like Five Points and Hell's Kitchen. The stakes have been raised to new levels, but the game was the same, cooperation or confrontation, and often death for defiance. JFK's death was a catalyst for a major cultural shift for Irish Americans. One of their own was in power, if only for a short time, and that meant they had been freed of the prejudice that followed them to the U.S. for a century. The fact that JFK was made a martyr offered them even more social acceptance in some ways. Now in the 1960s, many Irish Americans moved from the cities to the suburbs. Now the urban areas that had once served as the incubation areas for Irish American gangsters were out of Irish control. For some areas, it happened quicker than others, though, and throughout the 60s, some Irish gangs persisted, mostly in Boston. This was perhaps due to the fact that, unlike New York, Boston never had a Tammany Hall system to organize its crime. The city was broken down into a series of areas controlled by smaller gangs, Dorchester, Roxbury, South Boston, etc. The Mullen Gang, based along the South Boston waterfront, had spawned a whole new generation of gangsters throughout the 1950s and 60s, grappling for influence over the area's shipping ports, while the Italian Mafia moved on to their most profitable illicit trade since Prohibition, importing heroin. In Charlestown, on the north side of the city, several gang factions tended to be broken down into small groups of maybe just five, six members, often family affairs comprised of brothers. And they sometimes operated in conjunction with larger racketeering organizations, including the Italian Mafia. Uh, Boston's Irish-American underworld was mostly a collection of workers for hire, men with wives, children, mortgages, and debt. These men made money as freelance thieves, hijackers, bank robbers, bookmakers, policy runners, and hit men for hire who sold their services to the highest bidder, no matter their nationality. One of the most famous criminal capers in the city's history, other than the Gardner Museum heist we covered a little while ago, that likely had some Irish mobsters involved in it in some way, even if just after the fact, was the Brinks job, a skillfully planned and executed robbery by a small-time collection of local Irish and Italian hoods, led by James Spex O'Keefe, a professional criminal best known for his brazen shakedowns of gamblers and bookies in the Boston area, a seven-man robbery crew wearing identical Navy peacoats and Halloween masks, entered a Brink storage facility in the city's north end and made off with $2.7 million in cash, checks, money orders, and other securities. The robbery took place January 17, 1950 and was the largest single haul in U.S. history at that time. The crew agreed to keep the proceeds hidden for six years until the statute of limitations ran out. It was a good plan, but doomed to paranoia and greed. The robbers retreated into suspicious cliques, each convinced that the other group was going to make off with all the money. Two years after the initial robbery, O'Keefe approached the Italian faction of the robbery crew, demanded that they fork over 60 grand from the Brinks loot. 
His request was flatly denied. As gangsters often do when they don't get their way, O'Keefe reacted uh, poorly, impulsively. He kidnapped Vincent Costa, member of the original breaking crew, held him for ransom in a Boston hotel room. The Italian members of the Brinks gang then arranged for Specs to be paid a portion of the ransom in exchange for Costa's release, but this now made Specs a marked man. Following this, he survived two assassination attempts before he did the unthinkable and now testified against his fellow robbers in court. So, you know, so much for waiting six years and being rich. Now back to the gangs of Boston. Uh, a young man who would join the Mullen gang was named Pat Knee. He'd immigrated from Ireland with his family in 1952. Made his first foray into the Lighthouse Pub, where the gang gathered at the age of just 15. Eventually, Mickey McDonough, uh, M- Mickey McDonough and Mikey Ward, the leaders of the Mullen gang, uh, paid or put, excuse me, oh my God, too many names, put Knee to work, <laughs> allowing him to serve as a stick man for the neighborhood's card and dice games. Uh, the stick man's job was to hold the money during the game and call out no dice if a player's toss of the dice did not make contact with the wall, in which case the player crapped out, lost his wager, and often blamed the stick man. So to do this job, you had to be pretty fucking tough and not take any shit from other thugs thinking you just fucked him over. Eventually, Pat worked his way up to becoming a member of the gang in earnest and one of its territorial defenders. He was very tough. One legendary battle involving Pat took place in the summer of 1960 when a gang known as the Saints from the lower end of South Boston strutted onto the beach at Castle Island. Pat and E, Mikey Ward, small group of fellow Mullen gang members were drinking beer, lounging in the sun with their shirts off. The Mullen gang was outnumbered two to one, but Pat and E decided to brawl anyway. And later he would recall, So we all grabbed bottles and charged. Some of them scattered and we started picking them off, but one by one. They fought back pretty good. I got sliced down to the bone in my left hand. They had knives. We didn't. But we were tougher that day. We gave them a brutal, brutal beating. I remember one kid's face. It looked like we fucking skinned him. He got kicked so often. Others had jumped and got thrown in the water to get away from us. They dog paddled over to a big wooden raft, but we had a guy on that raft with a two by four. He was hitting him in the head and kicking him, trying to beat them back into the water. That was one of the roughest gang battles I ever saw. We all had cuts, concussions, broken noses, but they got the worst of it. Holy shit, these guys are fighting like the original Five Points Gangsters. This is some Butcher Bill type shit. Imagine being at the beach with the fam and seeing this level of violence break out. Just a dude on a raft bashing people in the head, trying to swim for safety. Some dude get, getting kicked in the face so many times looked like he'd been skinned. How did no one die that day? By the early 1960s, the Mullen Gang was the dominant gang in the neighborhood, surpassing the Saints, the Red Wings, the Shamrocks, and other gangs. They were also more than a little reckless. Right, they'd rob any place, even the Lighthouse Tavern, which was their own hangout spot. What an awkward place for them to rob. Uh, just coming in with masks, you know, just take all the money, put it in the bag, lady. Pat? Pat Nee? Is, is that you? Uh, no, it's not me, Marge. God damn it, come on, just put the fucking money in the bag. This isn't right, Pat. I know, Marge, I'm sorry. Uh, we won't do it again, but I'm, but I'm definitely not Pat. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll bring you something nice to make up for, but I'm not Pat Nee, that's for sure. Uh, the gang all became especially notorious for raiding commercial piers along the Boston waterfront. That was until they met Howie Winter, a racketeer and a businessman whose main scam took place within unions. Uh, they formed an alliance, leading many of the Mullen gang to become card-carrying members of the Teamsters and Longshoremen's unions. Now they mixed in with union picket lines, doing shit like when a truck operated by a scab driver would approach, they'd hop up on the truck, crack the driver in the fucking head with a blackjack, then fade back into the crowd and scurry down an alleyway. Hired muscle. These fuckers loved violence. And then things were about to get more violent. There would soon be a major gang war, the most sustained period of violence the underworld of the city of Boston had ever known. Started on Labor Day 1961, when two gangsters affiliated with the Winter Hill Gang rented a cottage on Salisbury Beach with their two girlfriends and an old pal named George McLaughlin. McLaughlin was a member of a notorious crew of crooks and contract killers who were friendly with Winter Hill and based in the neighborhood of Charlestown. And at some point, uh, dipshit George grabbed the breast of a girlfriend of a Winter Hill gangster. Not good on so many levels. This guy was a fucking idiot. Two Winter Hill gangsters proceeded to give George a beating so bad they thought he was dead. They dumped his body on the front lawn of a local hospital, truly not knowing if he was alive or not. And while George was a fucking putz, not one to be feared on his own, uh, his big brother was Bernie McLaughlin, a Charlestown gangster who sometimes did hits for the biggest mobsters in town. George wasn't dead. He was in intensive care, but still now the Charlestown boys wanted those Winter Hill gang members dead. The Charlestown guys quickly put a bomb under the car of Winter Hill leader Buddy uh, Buddy McLean, but McLean discovered it before it went off. And then it would be McLean's turn for revenge. 
He'd shoot Bernie McLaughlin dead in front of around, oh, 100 eyewitnesses at noon in City Square in Charlestown. And none of those witnesses dared to testify against him. Like literally not one would testify. All the police could get McLean on uh, was a gun possession charge. He was sent away to prison for two years. Two years later, late 1963, the very weak buddy is released from the penitentiary. Georgie McLaughlin shot and killed a man he thought he heard say nice things about Buddy at a party in Roxbury. Only George shot the wrong man. Some innocent victim named Billy Sheridan. Sucked to be that guy that day. And now a lot more murders would follow. May 3rd, 1964. A man named Frank Benjamin bragged about how he was going to take out the whole Winter Hill crew. A gunman loyal to the crew then shot Benjamin in the head and burned the fucking bar where he had been hanging out to the ground. The very next day, Benjamin's body was found in the trunk of a stolen car in South Boston, minus his head, which had been buried in the woods. A week later, the Charlestown boys struck back, killing Buddy McLean's bodyguard. A month after that, the Winter Hill gang got more revenge. Two Charlestown boys were lured to an apartment by a female friend of theirs. And when they got there, Buddy was waiting. Buddy was not a good buddy. He was a very naughty buddy. He was a bad buddy. He held a blowtorch to these two guys' fucking balls to get information, and then after finding everything he needed, strangled them both, dumped their bodies in the Boston Harbor. These guys are consistently terrifying. On September 4th, the uh, the bullet-riddled body of Ronald Dermody was now found in his car at a red light in Watertown. On September 2nd, Dermody had stormed into the Capitol Cafe on Broadway in Winter Hill, gunned down a man he thought was Buddy McLean. Unfortunately for Dermody, it was not. He shot a petty thief by the name of Charlie Robinson. When McLean heard what happened, put two and two together, he ordered Dermody's execution. This war continued through 1964 and into 1965. Men disappeared or were gunned down in the streets. By 1965, the Winter Hill Gang was now determined to get the eldest McLaughlin brother, Punchy McLaughlin. Yeah, sure, Punchy, why not? I love it. To do the job, uh, Buddy McLean turned to a mafia hit team led by Cadillac Frank Salemi and Joe Barboza, who would later become one of the first criminals to ever enter the Federal Witness Protection Program. Twice in early 1965, the Salemi Barboza hit team ambushed Punchy. (laughs) This is ridiculous. The first time the killers came dressed as rabbis, shot their target in the parking lot of a Beth Israel hospital. Punchy lived, but he did lose half of his jaw. My God. In the second assassination attempt, they shot off Punchy's right hand, like completely just gone. Man, the irony, a dude named fucking Punchy has now literally lost half of his punching power and looks like someone punched part of his face off. His nickname really hits different now, pun intended. In October of 1965, Franklin Salemi was approached by two FBI agents named H. Paul Rico and Dennis Condon. Rico was well known for his animosity towards the McLaughlins. And two days after he initially approached Salemi, he passed him by in a diner and slipped him a piece of paper. On the piece of paper was info regarding punching McLaughlin's whereabouts. Right? So the FBI, they can't legally kill this dude, uh, but they can let a couple guys who they know will kill him know where he is. On October 20th, 1965, Punchy McLaughlin is found dead. He'd been shot nine more times. So the uh, the third time was a charm. There was no surviving this hit. Nine days later, the Charleston crew, or Charlestown crew, uh, excuse me, uh, retaliates and kills their biggest target yet, Buddy McLean. The divided Irish mob just constantly whacking each other. The successors to McLaughlin, two brothers named Connie and Stevie Hughes, will be murdered next. Connie murdered May 25th, 1966. Four months later, his brother Stevie gunned down, excuse me, while stopped at a red light. The Charlestown crew were not, uh, they were done. Excuse me. They'd been wiped off the map. Other gangs would now fill the void. In early 1969, our old buddy Pat Nee, Mullen gang member, stopped into a bar near Boston called the Mad Hatter. It was kind of a no man's land outside of control of any one gang. On this night, Nee met a well-known member of the Killeen gang named James Whitey Bulger. I bet you recognize that name. By that time, Bulger was a veteran bank robber who had done some time in Alcatraz. We'll do a suck on this guy, a big one before long. Uh, On this day, there would be no time for the two gangsters to talk. Within moments, another member of the Mullen gang named Mickey Dwyer ran in, and he looked fucking rough. He was missing his nose. Like all of it. Like uh, he had woken up with his nose on his face that day. Same as every other day in his life. And now he doesn't have a nose. Why? His nose had been completely torn off and blood was streaming down his face. He'd gotten into a brutal fight with Kenny Colleen and Kenny had shot him in the arm and then held him down and literally bit his fucking nose off. Can you imagine that happening? Just someone an inch away from your face and they've gone full animal and they're just biting, ripping with their teeth, blood spraying everywhere, so much pain and then your nose is just gone. You never forget that awful moment. That is burned into your brain forever. 
Whitey Bulger was a member of the Killeen Gang, but Nee might not have known that, and he somehow escaped detection that day as the Mullen crew now sped off in search of their enemies. The next time these two would meet, Nee did know who Whitey was. Uh, they were in the middle of an ensuing gang war. In their next encounter, Pat Nee would shoot at Bulger while passed him by. As Bulger walked down the sidewalk, Bulger would shoot back. Nee would speed away. Neither man wounded. A tit-for-tat, mullen Colleen war went on for months. When not fighting, these guys are making money through robberies and hijackings mainly. In November of 1969, Pat Nee kills Kevin Daly now, one of the men who had participated in the killing of Pat's younger brother, Peter, or at least he thinks he kills him. But a few days later, he would be arrested and charged with attempted murder. Kevin Daly was in a wheelchair, but alive. And then Kellen, Kevin Daly would think better of his deathbed accusation and recant, and Nee would get away with it. Now let's jump ahead almost three years to May 13th, 1972. This night, Donald Colleen, the Irish mob boss of Southie now, celebrates his daughter's birthday at his home in Framingham, a Boston sub suburb. At some point during the celebration, Donald gets a call. After hanging up the phone, he tells his wife and father-in-law he needs to run a quick errand. I'll be right back. A few minutes later, Donna May Colleen and her father rush outside, find Donald slumped into the front seat of his car, riddled with bullets. He was the victim of a professional hit via a machine gun. The murder of the Colleen gang boss had gone off without a hitch. Most people suspected that the Mullen gang, probably acting with Howie Winter and the Winter Hill gang, were responsible. They would be the ones to now move in on the Colleen gang's territory. But Whitey Bulger, the next biggest Colleen, would do his best to stop that. He reached out to the very men who were responsible for Donald Colleen's death and demanded a meeting. At the meeting was Pat Nee, represented the Mullen Gang, Howie Winter, and numerous Italian mafiosos. Over the course of eight hours, they negotiated a settlement. Priority number one was that the city's gang wars come to an end and that everyone start conducting themselves like businessmen instead of violent thugs. For his part, Bulger promised that he would pacify Kenny Colleen, Donald's younger brother, and force Kenny to step aside. A few days later, he does that. Whitey himself tells Kenny, it's over. Kenny's out of the business. No future warnings are coming. And Kenny decided to listen probably because he knew if he didn't, he was going to get killed. Whitey had now taken over the Colleen gang and was in a good position to become the new Irish mob boss of South Boston. At the same time that Whitey was emerging as a major player in Boston's criminal underworld, the movies The Godfather, 1972, and Godfather Part II, 1974, were becoming cinematic legends. The movies captured the fascination of people all across the country, but it also made it seem like the only underworld figures were Italian-Americans, like the fictional Corleone family. And so the Irish increasingly found themselves cut out by business partners who wanted to work with the Don. How fucking weird. Art affecting real life in such an odd way there. Uh, this didn't affect things too much in Boston, but in cities like New Orleans and Chicago, the Irish-American mobster was virtually just done, eradicated. But in the little part of New York City, it was a different story still. By the mid-70s, the mafia in New York had regrouped, were bigger and stronger than ever. The five families, Gambino, uh, Bonanno, uh, Genovese, Lucchese and Colombo had determined that they should have control over every racket in town, seizing control through a series of coups. And they did control most of the city's crime. But on the west side of Manhattan, where Irish-American gangsters had now been operating for over 100 years, still wasn't the case. The Irish were going to battle for control of Hell's Kitchen. The battle for, the battle for Hell's Kitchen uh, would be more symbolic than anything. Things, uh, you know, there, there weren't true rackets to control since the waterfront's industry had been supplanted by air freight and overland shipping by the mid-50s. A series of high-profile trials meant most mobsters had fled the city, and the membership of the ILA on the port of New York had dropped from a high of around 40,000 to just 18,000 in 1970. The current mob boss of Hell's Kitchen was Irish-American Mickey Spillane, whose rap sheet listed more than 24 arrests. He'd gained the neighborhood's respect by refusing to talk to the police, even when it meant more time in prison, and he had tangled up with some Italian gangsters. The Italian mob had their eyes on two places, Madison Square Garden and the Coliseum, both of which employed thousands of people and had unions where mobsters could shore up power and make a lot of money. For years, ever since the days of Prohibition, right, these rackets have been divided between Italian and Irish control, but no longer. The Italian mob also had their eyes on the future Jacob Javits Convention Center, which was still under construction. So fat Tony Salerno, boss of the Genovese family, decides it's time to take out Mickey Spillane and his associates. For this, Tony chooses an associate of his own, Joseph Sullivan, a hardened Irish contract killer who was released from prison in the spring of 1976 after serving 10 years on a second-degree manslaughter charge. Eight weeks after agreeing to murder Tom Devaney, one of Spillane's top associates, Sullivan walks into a bar and grill in midtown Manhattan where Mickey Spillane's right-hand man was having a drink with a few friends. Sullivan was in disguise, wearing an Afro wig, darkened skin, made him appear vaguely Hispanic or Middle Eastern, orders a beer, sees Tom Devaney for a little while, until he's ready to make his move, 
After draining the last of his drink, he just walks over to Devaney, pulls out a gun, and just fucking blasts him in front of a whole bunch of witnesses. Over the following months, Sullivan then eliminates two more of Spillane's closest associates in a similar way. One of these was Eddie the Butcher Kaminsky, who used his skills as a butcher to cut up the bodies of the people he murdered and dispose of them in the river. Eddie was taken out by Sullivan at the Sunbright Saloon, August 20th, 1976. And now Spillane was going to figure out who was behind this. To figure out how to go about it, he travels to Florida, meets a man who once worked as a bootlegger for Oni the Killer Madden, and is a leg breaker for, the boss, uh, for boss Joe Ryan, Eddie McGrath. But Eddie, now 75, claimed not to know anything about it. Uh, yeah, so not knowing what to do, Spillane picks up his family, moves to Woodside, Queens. In his place, a young and violent upstart takes control. Irish-American gangster James Jimmy Coonan and his right-hand man, another Irish-American, Mickey Featherstone. By early 1977, Coonan controlled all the neighborhood rackets in Hell's Kitchen. But he was still worried about Spillane's old enemies and the Genovese crime family. He wants to take them out, but knows he's not strong enough to do it on his own. Needs a plan. The one he comes up with was the one that uh, Fat Tony used against Spillane. Go to one of their own. He reaches out to the Gambino crime family based in Brooklyn. Uh, he would meet with Roy DeMeo and gets him to back his play. Now that he has backup, Coonan goes up against the Genovese family. On his way from Keensburg, New Jersey on May 5th, 1977, where he lived with his wife, Edna, and their three kids, Coonan stopped at a food town supermarket, purchased an assortment of kitchen knives and some jumbo plastic bags. Uh-oh. And then goes on into the city. At the 596 Club, Coonan meets up with Danny Grillo, his Italian buddy from Wards Island, as well as three members of his own crew, Billy Beatty, Richie Ryan, and Tommy Hess. The plan was to whack Ruby Stein, a legendary loan shark, cut up his body, stick the parts in bags, dump them in the East River. Then he'd take over Stein's business, and that's exactly what he did. Ruby was butchered. The loan shark's disappearance was reported in the papers a few days later. In the New York Post, it was hinted that Stein had been the victim of a group of Hell's Kitchen gangsters dubbed the Westies by one local detective because of their base in the west side of Manhattan, and the name stuck. Over the next decade, the Westies would join gangs like the Dead Rabbits, Y.O.s, and Hudson Dusters uh, as a permanent fixture in the city's underworld lore. A few days later, May 13, 1977, the end would come for Hell's Kitchen mob boss Mickey Spillane. He was summoned out of his house by someone who said he had to talk to him and then immediately shot and killed on the sidewalk. And who killed him? Roy DeMeo. As a present for Jimmy Coonan, who was now officially the mob boss of Hell's Kitchen. The brutal Westies were in charge. And soon after, their brutal killings would get the attention of Big Polly, Paul Castellano, boss of all bosses, head of the Gambino Mafia family. Their sit-down would take place at the back of Tommaso's Restaurant in Bay Bridge, Brooklyn, February of 1978. At the meeting, Big Polly said that he was officially bringing the Westies into the fold. The Mafia would get 10% of their business, but they would also get 10% of the Mafia's business in Manhattan. And this was exactly what Jimmy Coonan wanted his whole life. Immediately following the sit-down in Brooklyn, the money started to roll in. Mickey Featherstone, for one, saw his weekly pay as Coonan's muscle increase from about $150 a week to $4,000 a week. Other opportunities to make money proliferated, especially in some construction rackets where the Westies were hiring themselves out as mafia subcontractors. By the late 1970s, the Westies were feeling like they were the mafia's employees, though, not their partners. As much money as they were making, the Italians were making so much more. Sounded like a good deal at first, was in many ways, but also played right into the Italian mob's hands. Throughout the 80s, the Westies would grapple for power, but never truly compete with the Italians, spending too much time fighting fellow Irish members. Coonan would even have right-hand man Featherstone framed for murder when he heard that he was uh, trying to take over his throne. Let's now check in on a different Irish gangster in New York. December 11th, 1978, James Jimmy Burke, an independent Irish underworld contractor, aims to pull off his greatest crime yet. Uh, for years, he operated in Queens, mostly smuggling untaxed liquor and cigarettes. He hijacked trucks, leaving JFK. Well, it was act, uh, actually well-liked because he usually left a couple hundred bucks for the airport's truck drivers that he stole from. Now Jimmy the Gent is aiming for something bigger. On December 11th, he and a group of masked men armed with rifles and pistols hit Building 261 at the Lufthansa Terminal at JFK Airport. The heist goes off without a shot being fired. The robbery crew loads bags containing $5 million in cash and another $875,000 in jewelry into a van. But what should have been a celebratory moment would seem like the beginning of the end. A spree of killings connected to this heist started in early 1979, continued throughout the year. Before it was over, more than 15 murders, more than 15, would be attributed to fallout from the Lufthansa heist. The entire robbery crew, except for Burke, were all fucking murdered gangland style. Man, flashbacks to the Garden Museum heist story again. Even when you get away with a heist, as far as law enforcement goes, how often do you really get away with it? 
How often do you just get fucking smoked by a fellow heist member? Uh, Wives and girlfriends who knew details about the heist were also killed. Their bodies cut up and dumped in rivers and vacant lots. Burke only escaped death himself by getting arrested on a parole violation in April of 1979. And then Henry Hill, Burke's half-Irish pal, puts Jimmy the Gent behind bars for life. Hill was facing life imprisonment on various narcotics violations at the time. And as part of a deal with the feds, he testifies against Burke, not about the Lufthansa heist, in which Hill had no direct involvement, but about one of the subsequent murders. Burke was given a life sentence and Hill disappears into the witness protection program. No one, it seems, benefited from that massive heist in the end. Fantasy ruined again. Uh, Henry Hill, anyone else thinking of uh, Hank Hill from King of the Hill when I say Henry Hill? Would later become the subject of a best-selling book called Wise Guy, written by Brooklyn native Nicholas Pileggi, and then would see himself portrayed by actor Ray Liotta in Goodfellas. Director Martin Scorsese's beloved 1990 mafia film based on that book. And Henry Hill would not be the first or last Irish mobster to end up in witness protection. The Omnibus Crime Control Act, a massive piece of legislation enacted in 1968, had established within the U.S. Justice Department a number of new far-reaching directives. Among them was the Witness Protection Program, which was designed to induce criminals to turn against their co-conspirators by offering them a new name, identity, and place to live after they testified in court. As a subtenant to the Witness Program, the FBI initiated an ambitious new system for cultivating informants. Individual agents were now encouraged to recruit and register CIs even when they were still active criminals or active criminals. And this would not surprisingly draw some pretty messy lines. Who was an agent? Who was a mobster? When agents did illegal things, sometimes purely for their own gain, did that make them mobsters? Who was loyal to whom? The man who would figure out how to play all these complicated factors against one another for their best gain or their personal gain was uh, Whitey Bulger. Agent Dennis Condon, a native of Charlestown, opened a file on Bulger with the intention of signing him as a CI. Condon and Bulger had a few conversations, uh, much of which Condon paraphrased, paraphrased in a series of FBI reports filed as far back as the early 70s. In 1975, Condon was approaching retirement, turned over the Bulger file to an ambitious young agent in the Boston office of the FBI named John Connolly. The relationship that developed between Bulger and Connolly would become a huge landmark in the history of the Irish mob. This relationship, a dramatized version of it, played out on the big screen in the Johnny Depp, Joel Edgerton movie, Black Mass. Another solid villain portrayal, by the way, with Depp as Whitey. So casually and calmly cold-blooded. Well, Connolly approached Whitey, offering him protection from his enemies if Bulger delivered crucial information about the Italian mafia's activities. Bulger jumped at the deal and then went back on a pretty crucial part of it, uh, not murdering people. Connolly did his part, dissuading prosecutors from filing federal indictments against their star witness. Other indictments flowed in. Uh, One set would result in nearly the entire upper echelon of the new Winter Hill Gang being imprisoned, including Howie Winter, who was sentenced to 10 years. Bulger now becomes leader of the Winter Hill Gang, which had absorbed the previously mentioned Colleen and Mullen gangs and continued to help bring down the competition. In 1981, in a daring late-night operation, the FBI planted a bug in the North End headquarters of Gennaro, Jerry, and Guillo, the Boston Mafia's boss, the bug would eventually bring Jerry down along with four of his brothers and nearly a dozen associates. And rumor has it that Whitey was behind it. The era of the informant had truly arrived. On December 18th, 1985, Big Polly Castellano uh, was whacked, killed on a busy midtown street during rush hour. Now there would be a new boss of the Gambino family, a man named John Gotti. Gotti would align himself with Coonan and the Westies back in New York now, obviously. Uh, but what Coonan didn't know was that while waiting trial for murder, uh, awaiting it, he would been, he'd been set up by a Mickey Featherstone who had turned state's witness and was planning on bringing a whole bunch of gangsters in New York down. From outside prison, Featherstone's wife, Sissy, was working to collect evidence that would help her husband. In the end, a judge would uh, overturn Featherstone's murder conviction. Immediately, Coonan went into hiding, but was eventually located in in New Jersey and arrested. Several gang members, upon hearing of Featherstone's cooperation, struck their own deals with the government. Bill Beatty became a government informant, agreeing to testify in court against the Westies after pleading guilty to RICO charges. Throughout 1986 into 1987, state murder indictments were returned against various members of the gang. Then in March, Rudolph uh, Giuliani, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, future New York City mayor, stepped in and announced a massive federal indictment, the biggest of its kind yet. Ten members of the Westies, including those already hit with state indictments, were charged on 14 counts of having taken part in a racketeering conspiracy. The RICO charges dated back some 20 years and included extortion, loan sharking, counterfeiting, gambling, and 16 counts of murder, attempted murder, 
and conspiracy to commit murder. The trial for all this began in September, exactly a year after Mickey Featherstone's cooperation with the government was first announced. Everyone from Hell's Kitchen who came to see the trial could not believe that Mickey Featherstone, the hard Vietnam vet, the mob killer, who'd enforced a code of silence and honor with his fists or a gun, was now dressed in a suit and a tie, speaking in a soft voice about the litany of crimes that his former friends had committed. 1988, the verdict would be announced. Guilty on all counts. The Irish mob of Hell's Kitchen was finished. Now only one Irish boss remained in Boston, Whitey Bulger. But instead of getting into the rest of his life and times now, we'll leave that for another episode we'll do here soon. Uh, Way too much for one episode. This one's already huge. It'll be fun to do a deep dive on one Irish gangster next time we jump back into this crazy ass world. Time right now to bounce out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. All right, before I wrap this up, just uh, just one more uh, quick, super important, and very, very real sponsor. Today's Time Talk is brought to you by Whipple Irish Mob Edition. Are you getting soft? Not feeling willing to do whatever it fucking takes to get what's yours? Don't even feel like bashing some fool's school with a brick bat or biting off part of their face? Sounds like you have two options. Check yourself into the old folks' home and die inside. Or pound the fucking Whipple! Irish Mob Edition, and really live. Take what you want by any means necessary. Every can of Irish Mob Edition is made with 20% brass knuckles, 15% silver knuckles, 13% someone else's knuckles. You cut off with a tomahawk in a street fight. 30% Guinness, 145% Jameson whiskey, 1,000% car bomb, 30% Lucky Charms, 10% pork chops, 200% mashed potatoes, three scoops of shepherd's pie, and two ounces of some Italian gangster motherfucker's blood. Fuck you, fuck your family, and drink Whipple Irish Mob Edition, the official pre-concert drink of you 2 and the Wu-Tang Clan, and a proud subsidiary of Bear Evil Incorporated. Sounds delish. Man, I uh, I can't wait to uh, crack open a can. Proud to have him as a sponsor. Uh, so the Irish Mob, such a fascinating history. A history that begins with British colonialism and Irish immigrants fleeing depressing and oppressive conditions. Beginning in the 1840s, Irish-American street gangs, such as the Dead Rabbits, led for a time by future U.S. Congressman John Morrissey, and the YOs dominated New York's burgeoning underworld. Beginning in the 1880s and 1890s, however, they faced increasing competition from gangs consisting of recently arrived Italians and Jews and more. Some of this competition would lead to unlikely alliances with the Irish. Some would not. During the early years of Prohibition, uh, Irish organized crime was given a big adrenaline boost. When Big Bill Dwyer emerged among many in New York's underworld as a leading bootlegger. Then following his arrest and trial for violation of the Volstead Act during 1925 and 1926, uh, fellow Irishman Oni the Killer Madden rose to prominence. Did an image search for Oni, by the way. My God, he looks like a hard motherfucker. Some serious battle scars on his face. And a real you do not want to fuck with me look in his eyes. Not surprising for a dude whose nickname was literally the killer. The end of Prohibition meant the virtual end of the domineering Irish mobster, but there were still plenty of Irish gangsters around and involved in various levels of at least somewhat organized crime. There were a ton of street gangs around the country, almost all along the East Coast, and there were still a bunch of active individual Irish mobsters who'd hired themselves out to perform others' dirty work. By the end of the 20th century, Irish-American mobsters were mostly all gone, either caught and imprisoned, killed by each other, killed in gang wars with the Italian mob, assimilation into non-Irish gangs, or just a victim of the times have changed. Their ranks were thinned down to just a few organizations in New York and Boston, mostly the Westies in New York and Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang in Boston, until they, uh, you know, will collapse as well and the run is over. Uh, Still historically, for many years, Irish Americans ruled America's underworld. They had their hands on almost every illegal racket there was, from union activities to politics to raiding shipping ports to the illegal manufacture and sale of alcohol in the Prohibition era. They also ran drugs, took out opponents, went head-to-head with the Italian mobsters, fought in so many gang wars. The most famous Irish mob wars had to do with everything from encroaching on one another's territory to grabbing a member's girlfriend's boob. Whenever something uh, happened to a fellow gang member, the rest of his gang would be there to back him up. Unless, of course, uh, that someone was vying for his spot. Or he could rat on him to get a reduced sentence. Along the way, the Irish would, through gang connections largely, enter U.S. politics, 
peaking, culminating with JFK's ascendancy to the presidency of the United States. They also infiltrated uh, many cities' police departments, fire departments, local governments across the country. For many years, the connection between these law enforcement institutions and the underworld was a lot closer than most Americans thought. I was surprised by how connected it all was. The relationship between Irish gangster and Irish law enforcement would even lead, in some ways, to the modern FBI informant. And that relationship would pound the last nail in the coffin for the Irish mob as a real criminal institution of any sort. Numerous former, numerous former Irish mobsters would turn state's witness and find themselves in federal protection, talking against the very men they had fought alongside. Before it was all over, holy shit, was there so much violence. Dudes biting each other's ears and noses off, bashing in skulls with brick bats, smashing dudes in the head with a two by four, blow torching some guy's fucking chicken skin duffel bag. I think two guys, actually. Uh, so much insanity. And it all started with starving immigrants just trying to get a little slice of the American dream. A house, wife, kids, good job, good friends. You deny a group of people the real chance to get that in an honest way. This story is just a reminder that inevitably, some of us meet sex. You're going to find a, a different way to grab that dream. Take it by any means necessary. Had there been less discrimination towards the Irish when they showed up? Had there been less discrimination against them back in the UK? Would they have ever made their mark in the American underworld like they have? Highly doubt it. I mean, some would, sure. I think uh, there will always be some crime. Some of us randomly more psychologically predisposed to it than others. But you take away the five points hellhole gang incubator, the history of the Irish in America would not include a lot of the stories I shared today. Bad for my storytelling purposes, but good for the many, many people that Irish gangsters destroyed in some way or another. Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Irish mob was an integral part of the United States underworld, going back to the 1850s when political bosses used recent immigrants for votes in exchange for food and shelter. Living a life on the margins incentivized Irish Americans to form gangs to protect themselves and then to climb out of poverty using whatever means they had. Number two, to be born in colonial Ireland was more than likely to be born into a horrible fate. British landlords made very restrictive laws. They made it literally impossible for many Irish to climb out of poverty. And they didn't lift a finger when mass starvation began as a direct result of many of their policies. Millions of Irish immigrants would seek a new life with opportunity in the land of the free over the century following the famine. And some of the toughest and most brutal would give rise to the Irish mob. Number three, brass knuckles, spiked clubs, hatchets, a variety of knives, tomahawks, ear biting, nose biting, kicking faces in, those damn brick bats. Irish mobsters were often savage in their violence. Sometimes you were lucky to just get shot. Number four, the era of the Irish gangster took a big dip in the middle of the 20th century when many Irish criminals ended up working for hire as opposed to working within organized gangs or made it out of poverty by joining the military or could actually make good livings and regular jobs after being accepted culturally in America. Still, some gangs would still persist, uh, especially in Boston until the age of the FBI informant led to the near total demise of the Irish American criminal underworld. Number five, new info. Early in the 2000s, FBI agents were led by an informant to a series of graves spread throughout the Boston area. The first was a gully alongside the Southeast Expressway in Dorchester, which contained three decomposed corpses. These three murder victims killed between 1983 and 1985 had originally been buried in the basement of a home on East 3rd Street in Southie, but they'd been, they were transferred when the house was sold in late 1985. One of the skeletons exhumed belonged to a 26-year-old woman strangled to death. Another skeleton had his teeth ripped out before being killed, result of a brutal torture session. A few months later, another killing field was unearthed at 144 Quincy Shore Drive. Another grave was uncovered in September of 2000 at Tiananmen Beach in Dorchester. Uh, investigators dug up a pile of bones or Tenian, excuse me, Tenian Beach. Investigators dug up a pile of bones. Generations of dead mob associates lay beneath the surface of Boston. Want to guess who is thought to have put those bodies there? Derek Skeet, Skeet Mullet, or maybe Whitey Bulger. And with that little tease to an episode we'll do soon, I will close this out. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Irish mob has been sucked. Another fascinating, I hope, slice of U.S. history. A uh, big thank you again to the Bad Magic team for help in production. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to Logan Keith, the Art Warlock, for directing and producing today. Thanks to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art Warlock again, creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com, helping run the socials. 
uh, with the team of Ryan Handelsman, Tyler C. as well, Emily Licardi. Thanks again to Sophie Evans for lead research. Oh, man, killed it this week. Also, thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, for making sure Discord keeps running smooth and everyone over on the Time Suck and Bad Magic Reddit threads. Next week on Time Suck, uh, we return to true crime, uh, murder, more murdery, the Bible Belt Strangler, another voted in topic. The Bible Belt Strangler is an unidentified serial killer or serial killers who murdered numerous women in the southeastern United States. Maybe. Uh, killer was only given this name recently by a high school student studying a series of unsolved murders. The victims of the Bible Belt Strangler generally classified into a group previously called the Redhead Murders. Throughout the 1980s, random women were turning up dead along highways in southern states. Similarities among the cases were disturbing. Victims, mostly young women, who often had red or reddish hair and had been strangled. Most of the victims were Jane Doe's. Their names, lives, how they ended up dead on the highways were unknown. Investigators believe that many of these women were homeless and or sex workers, sometimes runaways. They were most likely not murdered in the places they were found. They had no close family ties and it seemed like no one was looking for them. As more and more victims were found along the highways, investigators started to wonder if the murders were connected. Maybe some unidentified serial killer. And that unidentified serial killer thought to be a trucker driving through the southeast, picking up vulnerable women, strangling them, leaving their bodies along the road. As the months and years passed without arrests or identifications, investigators changed their theory. It seemed likely that there wasn't just one killer. There were probably multiple killers, some serial, some not, working in the same area. There is still disagreement among law enforcement and the public about which women are considered redhead murders victims. There are suspects in a few cases, but currently uh, not one individual suspected of being the Bible Belt Strangler. In the case of the redhead murders, there are far more questions than answers. So we'll explore this mystery next week. Discuss the redhead murders, the women who have been identified, those who remain Jane Doe's, the work of a bunch of really uh, cool, smart high school kids who have helped identify a lot of these bodies. We'll cover the men who have been connected with some of the cases, cases and why it has been so difficult for the police to find the killer or killers. Right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Let's start off laughing at uh, someone else's expense. Complete fucking disgusting jerk off degenerate. Cress Van Wingarden writes, Dan, you beautiful bullshit slinging bastard. You got me. Some background. I'm a farmer. I was delivering some of my corn to the local processing plant to my semi truck while listening to time suck via an FM transmitter. This is important in my semi truck. I pulled into the lot listening to the skull and bones suck. No problem. I didn't think that the signal strength on my little transmitter was powerful enough to escape my truck, but it must have been powerful enough to intrude on the Spotify playlist of some of the other 30 plus trucks in the lot also using a transmitter. I use 88.7 as it is one of the only dead frequencies. So do most people around here. Things are going great until you started waxing eloquently about George H.W. Bush beating off in a coffin (laughs) while recounting his sexual conquest to 13 other guys who are also beating off or some other silly bullshit. Suddenly, the CB radio that we were uh, that we drivers used to speak to each other and plant operators crackled with, whoever is transmitting on 88.7, what the fuck? Cue a bunch of farmers slash truckers all switching to 88.7 to try to catch what's going on and a bunch of confusion and disgust dripping from the CB radio as I try to look like I was not the offender. It was glorious and horrifying. I'm still going to listen on 88.7, but question that decision when I, or I was still going to listen when I flipped over to the Mouse Utopia episode on my next trip and arrived at the plant again, just in time to hear you bullshitting about falling birth rates due to underground hentai jerk-off clubs. <laughs> I have too many jerk-off jokes, clearly. Uh, keep up the good work, loyal listener, Cress. Thank you, Cress. I appreciate you spreading this suck in a brand new way. I say keep transmitting. Refuse to identify yourself. Uh, the Jeffrey Lundgren two-parter. Oh, man. Those are great ones for everyone to hear, I think. And this uh, spring and summer, we have a whole bunch of especially horrific serial killers coming up. So share the joy. Hail Nimrod. And now Sweet Sack Sarah Says shares how she learned that no topic is safe from crude horseshit here. I'm guessing Says is not your real last name. Uh, Sarah writes, hello, Dan, who sucketh on high and also the Bad Magic team. I've got a double Cummins law for you. So strap on those boots, soldier. It's a long one. I'm a longtime Bad Magic fan who's just recently become a space lizard. I'm a letter carrier for the U.S. Postal Service, and I spend several hours a day in my truck alone delivering mail. Your podcast keep me highly entertained, so thanks for curing my boredom. Several months ago, after making my way through the back uh, catalog of Scared to Death and Is We Dumb, I started Time Suck, jumping around episodes, picking what seemed interesting to me. 
After hearing a few serial killer sucks in my house, I knew that I needed to pick a less aggressive topic to listen to at work. I chose episode 284, The Amish Life, thinking how inappropriate could he possibly be? (laughs) And put it on Bluetooth speaker my work truck. My truck is very loud, so I had the speaker turned way up to hear it. I had my window down delivering mail, not a soul in sight. You were describing normal Amish life, nothing weird, and you led me into a false sense of security. Damn you. Uh, damn you, Lucifer. Just as you were describing what they wear, I saw one of my customers come out of her house, and at the top of your lungs, you yelled that the unmarried women wear black bonnets in many groups, signifying that they're trolling for single hard dick. You, scre- <laughs> you screamed dick just as he reached my truck to get her mail. All I could do was turn several shades of red and avoid eye contact. I couldn't even apologize because I was choking on laughter and I just drove off in embarrassment. Since then, I've learned to always use earbuds while listening to Time Suck in public. I've also uh, spread the suck to my best friend, Lauren. She's a cardiac nurse. Her job is more intense than mine, so she listens on her off days. (laughs) I love this so much. I just remember what this was. This is so good. One day while she was running errands and I was working, I was listening to The Secret Suck. We had been communicating all morning through an app called Marco Polo. It's like FaceTime, but it's not live. Oh, no, I know all about Marco Polo. Lindsay has been obsessed with it for about a year. Her and her friends use Marco Polo. I like, how the fuck do they have this much time to send each other messages? It's insane. Um, but yeah, you record messages, and then the person can listen to them whenever. I find this more convenient than texting because I can just press record and talk with mail in my hands. Yeah, totally get it. So in the secret suck, you were talking about... <laughs> I love that there's so much jerk off stuff. So in the secret suck, you were talking about some weird sex thing where ancient Egyptian pharaohs would jerk off into the Nile. I think that was actually true and started re- uh, ranting about what if American politicians jerked off for ceremonies. I knew I couldn't do it just as recapping. I was literally in tears laughing. So I pressed play on the podcast and then started recording a polo for Lauren to hear it. Mind you, we've been sending polos all morning about normal stuff. She had no idea that I was going to send her a clip of you ranting about politicians jerking off. So she's in Chipotle with a burrito in one hand and her phone in the other. She presses play on her polo and you're going on about how funny it would be to see people gathered around the president jerking off to commemorate some serious thing. She starts fumbling with her phone, trying to turn it down, but ends up turning it up to max volume. She said she literally ran out of the Chipotle crying with laughter and sent me a return message with what happened and uh, how thanks to you, she can never return to her favorite burrito spot. Oh, well, that's how we do it in Hollywood. Showbiz. If you read this on air, could you please give Lauren a shout out? She works so hard. She doesn't get the respect she deserves for saving lives as a cardiac nurse. And I love her so much. I love this. Uh, she and I have spent so many hours laughing about Time Suck and I know it would make her day. We plan to spread the suck together with some shenanigans. We have a friend who owns a van covered in stickers. He takes it so seriously that he removed all the stickers, laminated and reapplied them so that they would last longer. I've ordered the Albert Fish sticker sheet and we plan on hiding crunchy peanut butt butter stickers amongst the rest. And waiting to see how long it takes him to realize it. He's going to be so mad and we can't wait. We'll send you a picture if you want. Yeah, I do want. My husband and I are coming to your stand-up show in Philly, March 25th. Can't wait to see you. Hope you had, I do. I hope you had fun. Thanks for all that you do and the Bad Magic team. You mean much, so much to us. You feel like family. Give Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell a scratch for us. Good boy, Bojangles. Your loyal space lizard, Sarah C. Sarah, I am so lucky to have awesome folks like you and Lauren. Enjoy my stupid bullshit. Brings me so much joy and I laugh so hard picturing the Chipotle debacle. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, know about this message before uh, Philly. I hope you, uh, it seems like you had fun. Uh, happy to scratch the girls. Love being a part of your family. Good luck with the van. And then speaking of stickers, one last message, an unusual one. Uh, quick message from an anonymous employee of a local hamburger drive here in Coeur d'Alene called Zips. Uh, there's a Zips right down the street from the Suck Dungeon. And at least one person there, well, at least two people actually are fucking sick of my bullshit. Uh, the employee writes, Please don't put your stickers on our bathroom trash cans. Our boss yelled at us because it was on it. Now now I've been scraping this thing off for a good 30 minutes. And that's all they wrote. And I just want to say thank you, Zips employee. I can see how that is frustrating, but here's the thing. I didn't put it there. I can't control where our stickers go. And now because you sent this message and because I'm reading it here, I feel like you've made yourself a target for more stickers. I feel like like you've really laid down a challenge. To have your bathroom trash can completely fucking covered in stickers. And uh, how about you tell your boss to calm the fuck down? It's a bathroom trash can in a burger drive through There are far worse things already all over the surfaces of that room than stickers. Just let them be. It gives it a little more personality. You know, maybe more stickers from other places will be added. Some cool band stickers and stuff. And soon the bathroom will actually look fucking cool and distract from the smell of diarrhea and cheesy fries. <laughs> so, can't help you. 
And uh, But we are going to do the Sticker Street team again this year, and I look forward to doing that soon. And thanks, everybody, for sending in your messages. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death, time suck each week. The secret suck each week for you space lizards on Patreon. Please do not smash into anyone's skull with a brick bat this week. Or bite their ear or nose off. Stop pretending you're in the Irish mob. It's over. Just keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Hey, guys, thanks for coming over to the uh, the Irish gang meeting. We got Greasy Liam here. We got Kiki Mulligan. We got one in McLaughlin. Oh, oh it's Gucci Riley. Uh, Lucky Charms Murphy. We got Brick Battle Doyle. It's good to see you. Uh, Skims Patty, how you doing? Uh, we got Binky Sullivan. We got Two Scoops Kelly. Ah, it's good to see you back out of the joint, my friend. Sprinkles of Walls, how you been? We got Four Toots McCarthy. Uh, Weasel Spunk Ryan, you're looking great. Three Nachos O'Connor. Ah, look at you, you killer. We got Dinky O'Malley, uh, Cut Your Mouse, Fucking Head Off Nolan, and we got Likes to Play with Choo Choo Trains, Fitzpatrick. Let's get, let's get it started.